Lord Arthur Savile's Crime and Other Stories by Oscar Wilde. Section 1. Chapters 1 and 2 of Lord Arthur Savile's Crime. Chapter 1. It was Lady Windermere's last reception before Easter, and Bentinck House was even more crowded than usual. Six cabinet ministers had come on from the speaker's levee in their stars and ribands. All the pretty women wore their smartest dresses, and at the end of the picture gallery stood the Princess Sophia of Karlsruhe, a heavy, tartar-looking lady with tiny black eyes and wonderful emeralds, talking bad French at the top of her voice and laughing immoderately at everything that was said to her. It was certainly a wonderful medley of people, Gorgeous peeresses chatted affably to violent radicals. Popular preachers brushed coat-tails with eminent sceptics. A perfect bevy of bishops kept following a stout prima donna from room to room. On the staircase stood several royal academicians disguised as artists. And it was said that at one time the supper-room was absolutely crammed with geniuses. In fact, it was one of Lady Windermere's best nights and the princess stayed till nearly half-past eleven. As soon as she had gone, Lady Windermere returned to the picture-gallery, where a celebrated political economist was solemnly explaining the scientific theory of music to an indignant virtuoso from Hungary, and began to talk to the Duchess of Paisley. She looked wonderfully beautiful with her grand ivory throat, her large blue forget-me-not eyes, and her heavy coils of golden hair or purr they were not that pale straw colour that nowadays usurps the gracious name of gold but such gold as is woven into sunbeams or hidden in strange amber and they gave to her face something of the frame of a saint with not a little of the fascination of a sinner she was a curious psychological study early in life she had discovered the important truth that nothing looks so like innocence as an indiscretion, and by a series of reckless escapades, half of them were quite harmless. She had acquired all the privileges of a personality. She had more than once changed her husband. Indeed, the Brett credits her with free marriages, but as she had never changed her lover, the world had long ago ceased to talk scandal about her. She was now forty years of age, childless, and with that inordinate passion for pleasure, which is the secret of remaining young. Suddenly she looked eagerly round the room, and said, in her clear contralto voice, "'Where is my curamantist?' "'You're what, Gladys?' exclaimed the Duchess, giving an involuntary start. "'My curamantist, Duchess. I can't live without him at present.' "'Dear Gladys, you are always so original,' murmured the Duchess, trying to remember, what a chiromantist really was, and hoping it was not the same as a chiropodist. "'He comes to see my hand twice a week regularly,' continued Lady Windermere, "'and is most interesting about it.' "'Good heavens!' said the Duchess to herself. "'He is a sort of chiropodist after all. How very dreadful! I hope he is a foreigner, at any rate. It wouldn't be quite so bad, then. I must certainly introduce him to you.' "'Introduce him?' cried the Duchess. "'You don't mean to say he is here?' And she began looking about for a small tortoise-shell fan and a very tattered lace shawl, so as to be ready to go at a moment's notice. "'Of course he is here. I would not dream of giving a party without him. He tells me I have a pure psychic hand, and that if my thumb had been the least little bit shorter I should have been a confirmed pessimist and gone into a convent.' "'Oh, I see,' said the Duchess, feeling very much relieved. "'He tells fortunes, I suppose?' "'And misfortunes, too,' answered Lady Windermere. "'Any amount of them. Next year, for instance, I am in great danger, both by land and sea. So I am going to live in a balloon, and draw up my dinner in a basket every evening. It is all written down on my little finger, or on the palm of my hand.' I forget which. But surely that is tempting Providence, Gladys. My dear Duchess, surely Providence can resist temptation by this time. I think every one should have their hands told once a month, 
so as to know what not to do. Of course, one does it all the same, but it is so pleasant to be warned. Now, if someone doesn't go and fetch Mr. Podgers at once, I shall have to go myself. Let me go, Lady Windermere, said a tall, handsome young man, who was standing by, listening to the conversation with an amused smile. Thanks so much, Lord Arthur, but I am afraid you wouldn't recognise him. If he is as wonderful as you say, Lady Windermere, I couldn't well miss him. Tell me what he is like, and I'll bring him to you at once. Well, he is not a bit like a curamantist. I mean, he is not mysterious, or esoteric, or romantic-looking. He is a little stout man, with a funny bald head, and great gold-rimmed spectacles, something between a family doctor and a country attorney. I'm really very sorry, but it is not my fault. People are so annoying. All my pianists look exactly like poets, and all my poets look exactly like pianists. And I remember last season asking a most dreadful conspirator to dinner, a man who had blown up ever so many people, and always wore a coat of mail, and carried a dagger up his shirt-sleeve. And do you know that when he came he looked just like a nice old clergyman, and cracked jokes all the evening? Of course, he was very amusing, but I was awfully disappointed, and when I asked him about the coat of mail, he only laughed, and said it was far too cold to wear in England. Ah, here is Mr. Podgers. Now, Mr. Podgers, I want you to tell the Duchess of Paisley's hand. Duchess, you must take your glove off. No, not the left hand, the other. Dear Gladys, I really don't think it is quite right, said the Duchess, feebly unbuttoning a rather soiled kid glove. Nothing interesting ever is, said Lady Windermere. On a fait le monde ainsi. But I must introduce you. Duchess, this is Mr. Podgers, my pet curamantist. Mr. Podgers, this is the Duchess of Paisley. And if you say that she has a larger mountain of the moon than I have, I will never believe in you again. I am sure, Gladys, there is nothing of the kind in my hand said the duchess gravely your grace is quite right said mr podgers glancing at the little fat hand with its short square fingers the mountain of the moon is not developed the line of life however is excellent kindly bend the wrist thank you three distinct lines on the rosette you will live to a great age duchess and be extremely happy ambition very moderate line of intellect not exaggerated line of heart now do be indiscreet mr podgers cried lady windermere nothing would give me greater pleasure said mr podgers bowing if the duchess ever had been but i am sorry to say that i see great permanence of affection combined with a strong sense of duty pray go on mr podgers said the duchess looking quite pleased economy is not the least of your grace's virtues continued mr podgers and lady windermere went off into fits of laughter. "'Economy is a very good thing,' remarked the Duchess complacently. "'When I married Paisley, he had eleven castles, and not a single house fit to live in. And now he has twelve houses, and not a single castle,' cried Lady Windermere. "'Well, my dear,' said the Duchess, "'I like—' "'Comfort,' said Mr. Podgers, "'and modern improvements, and hot water laid on in every bedroom.' Your grace is quite right. Comfort is the only thing our civilization can give us. You have told the Duchess's character admirably, Mr. Podgers, and now you must tell Lady Flora's. And in answer to a nod from the smiling hostess, a tall girl with sandy Scotch hair and high shoulder blades, stepped awkwardly from behind the sofa, and held out a long bony hand with spatulate fingers. Ah, a pianist, I see said Mr. Podgers. An excellent pianist, but perhaps hardly a musician. Very reserved, very honest, and with a great love of animals. Quite true, exclaimed the Duchess, turning to Lady Windermere. Absolutely true. Flora keeps two dozen collie dogs at McCloskey, and would turn her house into a menagerie if her father would let her. Well, that is just what I do with my house every Thursday evening cried Lady Windermere, laughing. Only, I like the lions better than collie dogs. 
your one mistake lady windermere said mr podgers with a pompous bow if a woman can't make her mistakes charming she is only a female was the answer but you must read some more hands for us come said thomas show mr podgers yours and a genial-looking old gentleman in a white waistcoat came forward and held out a thick rugged hand with a very long third finger an adventurous nature four long voyages in the past and one to come been shipwrecked three times no only twice but in danger of a shipwreck on your next journey a strong conservative very punctual and with a passion for collecting curiosities had a severe illness between the ages of sixteen and eighteen was left a fortune when about thirty great aversion to cats and radicals extraordinary exclaimed sir thomas you must really tell my wife's hand too your second wife's said mr podgers quietly still keeping sir thomas's hand in his your second wife's i shall be charmed but lady marvel a melancholy looking woman with brown hair and sentimental eyelashes entirely declined to have her past or her future exposed and nothing that lady windermere could do would induce monsieur de koloff the russian ambassador even to take his gloves off in fact many people seemed afraid to face the odd little man with his stereotyped smile his gold spectacles and his bright beady eyes and when he told poor lady fermor right out before everyone that she did not care a bit for music but was extremely fond of musicians it was generally felt that chiromancy was a most dangerous science and one that ought not to be encouraged except in a tete-a-tete -tete. lord arthur savile however who did not know anything about lady firma's unfortunate story and who had been watching mr podgers with a great deal of interest was filled with an immense curiosity to have his own hand read and feeling somewhat shy about putting himself forward crossed over the room to where lady windermere was sitting and with a charming blush asked her if she thought mr podgers would mind of course he won't mind said lady windermere that is what he is here for all my lions lord arthur are performing lions and jump through hoops whenever i ask them but i must warn you beforehand that i shall tell sybil everything she is coming to lunch with me to-morrow to talk about bonnets and if mr podgers finds out that you have a bad temper or a tendency to gout or a wife living in bayswater i shall certainly let her know all about it lord arthur smiled and shook his head i am not afraid he answered sybil knows me as well as i know her ah i am a little sorry to hear you say that the proper basis for marriage is a mutual misunderstanding no i am not at all cynical i have merely got experience which however is very much the same thing mr podgers lord arthur savile is dying to have his hand read don't tell him that he is engaged to one of the most beautiful girls in london because that appeared in the morning post a month ago dear lady windermere cried the marchioness of jedburgh do let mr podgers stay here a little longer he has just told me i should go on the stage and i am so interested if he has told you that lady jedburgh i shall certainly take him away come over at once mr podgers and read lord arthur's hand well said lady jedburgh making a little moo as she rose from the sofa if i am not to be allowed to go on the stage i must be allowed to be part of the audience at any rate of course we are all going to be part of the audience said lady windermere and now mr podgers be sure and tell us something nice lord arthur is one of my special favourites but when mr podgers saw lord arthur's hand he grew curiously pale and said nothing a shudder seemed to pass through him and his great bushy eyebrows twitched convulsively in an odd irritating way they had when he was puzzled then some huge beads of perspiration broke out on his yellow forehead like a poisonous dew and his fat fingers grew cold and clammy lord arthur did not fail to notice these strange signs of agitation for the first time in his life he himself felt fear his impulse was to rush from the room but he restrained himself 
it was better to know the worst, whatever it was, than to be left in this hideous uncertainty. "'I am waiting, Mr. Podgers,' he said. "'We are all waiting,' cried Lady Windermere, in her quick, impatient manner. But the chiromantist made no reply. "'I believe Arthur is going on the stage,' said Lady Jedburgh, "'and that, after your scolding, Mr. Podgers is afraid to tell him so.' Suddenly Mr. Podgers dropped Lord Arthur's right hand and seized hold of his left, bending down so low to examine it that the gold rims of his spectacles seemed almost to touch the palm. For a moment his face became a white mask of horror. But he soon recovered his sang-froid, and looking up at Lady Windermere, said with a forced smile, "'It is the hand of a charming young man.' "'Of course it is!' answered Lady Windermere. But will he be a charming husband? That is what I want to know. All charming young men are, said Mr. Podgers. I don't think a husband should be too fascinating, murmured Lady Jedburgh pensively. It is so dangerous. My dear child, they never are too fascinating, cried Lady Windermere. But what I want are details. Details are the only things that interest. What is going to happen to Lord Arthur? Well, within the next few months, Lord Arthur will go a voyage. Oh, yes, his honeymoon, of course. And lose a relative. Not his sister, I hope, said Lady Jedburgh, in a piteous tone of voice. Certainly not his sister, answered Mr. Podgers, with a deprecating wave of the hand. A distant relative, merely. Well, I am dreadfully disappointed said Lady Windermere. I have absolutely nothing to tell Sybil to-morrow. No one cares about distant relatives nowadays. They went out of fashion years ago. However, I suppose she had better have a black silk by her. It always does for church, you know. And now let us go to supper. They are sure to have eaten everything up, but we may find some hot soup. Francois used to make excellent soup once, but... He is so agitated about politics at present, that I never feel quite certain about him. I do wish General Boulanger would keep quiet. Duchess, I am sure you are tired. Not at all, dear Gladys, answered the Duchess, waddling towards the door. I have enjoyed myself immensely, and the chiropodist, I mean the chiromantist, is most interesting. Flora, where can my tortoise shell fan be? Oh, thank you, Sir Thomas, so much. And my lace shawl, Flora? Oh, thank you, Sir Thomas. Very kind, I'm sure. And the worthy creature finally managed to get downstairs without dropping her scent bottle more than twice. All this time Lord Arthur Savile had remained standing by the fireplace with the same feeling of dread over him, the same sickening sense of coming evil. He smiled sadly at his sister as she swept past him on Lord Plymdale's arm looking lovely in her pink brocade and pearls, and he hardly heard Lady Windermere when she called to him to follow her. He thought of Sybil Merton, and the idea that anything could come between them made his eyes dim with tears. Looking at him, one would have said that Nemesis had stolen the shield of Pallas, and shown him the Gorgon's head. He seemed turned to stone, and his face was like marble in its melancholy. He had lived the delicate and luxurious life of a young man of birth and fortune, a life exquisite in its freedom from sordid care, its beautiful boyish insouciance, and now for the first time he became conscious of the terrible mystery of destiny, of the awful meaning of doom. How mad and monstrous it all seemed! Could it be that written on his hand in characters that he could not read himself, but that another could decipher? was some fearful secret of sin, some blood-red sign of crime. Was there no escape possible? Were we no better than chessmen, moved by an unseen power, vessels the potter fashions at his fancy, for honour or for shame? His reason revolted against it, and yet he felt that some tragedy was hanging over him, and that he had been suddenly called upon to bear an intolerable burden. Actors, are so fortunate they can choose whether they will appear in tragedy or in comedy whether they will suffer or make merry laugh 
or shed tears, but in real life it is different. Most men and women are forced to perform parts for which they have no qualifications. Our Guildensterns play Hamlet for us, and our Hamlets have to jest like Prince Hal. The world is a stage, but the play is badly cast. Suddenly Mr. Podgers entered the room. When he saw Lord Arthur, he started, and his coarse, fat face became a sort of greenish-yellow colour. The two men's eyes met, and for a moment there was silence. "'The Duchess has left one of her gloves here, Lord Arthur, and has asked me to bring it to her,' said Mr. Podgers, finally. "'Ah, I see it on the sofa. Good evening.' "'Mr. Podgers, I must insist on your giving me a straightforward answer to a question I am going to put to you. Another time, Lord Arthur, but the Duchess is anxious. I am afraid I must go. You shall not go. The Duchess is in no hurry. Ladies should not be kept waiting, Lord Arthur, said Mr. Podgers, with his sickly smile. The fair sex is apt to be impatient. Lord Arthur's finely chiselled lips curled in petulant disdain. The poor Duchess seemed to him of very little importance at that moment. He walked across the room to where Mr. Podgers was standing, and held his hand out. "'Tell me what you saw there,' he said. "'Tell me the truth. I must know it. I am not a child.' Mr. Podgers' eyes blinked behind his gold-rimmed spectacles, and he moved uneasily from one foot to the other, while his fingers played nervously with a flash-watch chain. "'What makes you think that I saw anything in your hand, Lord Arthur, more than I told you?' "'I know you did, and I insist on your telling me what it was. I will pay you. I will give you a cheque for a hundred pounds.' The green eyes flashed for a moment, and then became dull again. "'Guineas,' said Mr. Podgers, at last, in a low voice. "'Certainly. I will send you a cheque to-morrow. What is your club?' "'I have no club. That is to say, not just at present.' My address is, but allow me to give you my card. And producing a bit of gilt-edge pasteboard from his waistcoat pocket, Mr. Podgers handed it with a low bow to Lord Arthur, who read on it, Mr. Septimus R. Podgers, Professional Curamantist, 103A West Moon Street. My hours are from ten to four, murmured Mr. Podgers mechanically, and I make a reduction for families. Be quick cried Lord Arthur, looking very pale, and holding his hand out. Mr. Podgers glanced nervously round, and drew the heavy portiere across the door. "'It will take a little time, Lord Arthur. You had better sit down.' "'Be quick, sir,' cried Lord Arthur again, stamping his foot angrily on the polished floor. Mr. Podgers smiled, drew from his breast pocket a small magnifying glass, and wiped it carefully with his handkerchief. I am quite ready, he said. Chapter 2 Ten minutes later, with face blanched by terror and eyes wild with grief, Lord Arthur Seville rushed from Bentinck House, crushing his way through the crowd of fur-coated footmen that stood round a large striped awning, and seemed not to see or hear anything. The night was bitter cold, and the gas lamps round a square flared and flickered in the keen wind. But his hands were hot with fever, and his forehead burned like fire. On and on he went, almost with the gait of a drunken man. A policeman looked curiously at him as he passed, and a beggar, who slouched from an archway to ask for alms, grew frightened, seeing misery greater than his own. Once he stopped under a lamp and looked at his hands. He thought he could detect the stain of blood already upon them, and a faint cry broke from his trembling lips. Murder! That is what the curamantist had seen there. Murder! The very night seemed to know it, and the desolate wind to howl it in his ear. The dark corners of the streets were full of it. It grinned at him from the roofs of the houses. First he came to the park, whose sombre woodland seemed to fascinate him. He leaned wearily up against the railings, cooling his brow against the wet metal, and listening to the tremulous silence of the trees. Murder! Murder! he kept repeating, as though iteration could dim the horror of the word. The sound of his own voice made him shudder. 
that he almost hoped that Echo might hear him, and wake the slumbering city from its dreams. He felt a mad desire to stop the casual passer-by and tell him everything. Then he wandered across Oxford Street into narrow, shameful alleys. Two women with painted faces mocked at him as he went by. From a dark courtyard came a sound of oaths and blows, followed by shrill screams, and, huddled upon a damp doorstep, he saw the crook-backed forms of poverty and eld. A strange pity came over him. Were these children of sin and misery predestined to their end, as he to his? Were they, like him, merely the puppets of a monstrous show? And yet it was not the mystery, but the comedy of suffering that struck him. Its absolute uselessness, its grotesque want of meaning. How incoherent everything seemed! How lacking in all harmony! He was amazed at the discord between the shallow optimism of the day and the real facts of existence. He was still very young. After a time, he found himself in front of Marie Le Bon Church. The silent roadway looked like a long riband of polished silver, flecked here and there by the dark arabesques of waving shadows. Far into the distance curved the line of flickering gas lamps, and outside a walled-in house stood a solitary hansom, the driver asleep inside. He walked hastily in the direction of Portland Place, now and then looking round, as though he feared that he was being followed. At the corner of Rich Street stood two men, reading a small bill upon a hoarding. An odd feeling of curiosity stirred him, and he crossed over. As he came near, the word murder, printed in black letters, met his eye. He started, and a deep flush came into his cheek. It was an advertisement, offering a reward for any information, leading to the arrest of a man of medium height, between thirty and forty years of age, wearing a billycock hat, a black coat, and check trousers, with a scar upon his right cheek. He read it over and over again, and wondered if the wretched man would be caught, and how he had been scarred. Perhaps some day his own name might be placarded on the walls of London. Some day, perhaps, a price would be set on his head also. The thought made him sick with horror. He turned on his heel and hurried on into the night. Where he went he hardly knew. He had a dim memory of wandering through a labyrinth of sordid houses, of being lost in a giant web of sombre streets, and it was bright dawn when he found himself at last in Piccadilly Circus. As he strolled home towards Belgrave Square, he met the great wagons on their way to Covent Garden, the white smocked carters, with their pleasant sunburnt faces and coarse curly hair, strode sturdily on, cracking their whips, and calling out now and then to each other, on the back of a huge grey horse, the leader of a jangling team, sat a chubby boy with a bunch of primroses in his battered hat, keeping tight hold of the mane with his little hands, and laughing, and the great piles of vegetables looked like masses of jade against the morning sky, like masses of green jade against the pink petals of some marvellous rose. Lord Arthur felt curiously affected. He could not tell why. There was something in the dawn's delicate loveliness that seemed to him inexpressibly pathetic, and he thought of all the days that break in beauty, and that set in storm. These rustics, too, with their rough, good-humoured voices, and their nonchalant ways, what a strange London they saw! A London, free from the sin of night and the smoke of day, a pallid, ghost-like city, a desolate town of tombs! He wondered what they thought of it, and whether they knew anything of its splendour and its shame, of its fierce, fiery-coloured joys, and its horrible hunger, of all it makes and mars from morn to eve. Probably it was to them merely a mart where they bought their fruits to sell, and where they tarried for a few hours at most, leaving the streets still silent, the houses still asleep. It gave him pleasure to watch them as they went by, rude as they were, 
with their heavy hobnailed shoes and their awkward gait they brought a little of a ready with them he felt that they had lived with nature and that she had taught them peace he envied them all that they did not know by the time he had reached belgrave square the sky was a faint blue and the birds were beginning to twitter in the gardens End of section one chapters three and four of lord arthur savile's crime when lord arthur woke it was twelve o'clock and the midday sun was streaming through the ivory silk curtains of his room he got up and looked out of the window a dim haze of heat was hanging over the great city and the roofs of the houses were like dull silver in the flickering green of the square below some children were flitting about like white butterflies and the pavement was crowded with people on their way to the park never had life seemed lovelier to him never had the things of evil seemed more remote then his valet brought him a cup of chocolate on a tray after he had drunk it he drew aside a heavy portiere of peach-coloured plush and passed into the bathroom the light stole softly from above through thin slabs of transparent onyx and the water in the marble tank glimmered like a moonstone he plunged hastily in till the cool ripples touched throat and hair and then dipped his head right under as though he would have wiped away the stain of some shameful memory when he stepped out he felt almost at peace the exquisite physical conditions of the moment had dominated him as indeed often happens in the case of very finely wrought natures for the senses like fire can purify as well as destroy after breakfast he flung himself down on a divan and lit a cigarette on the mantel-shelf framed in dainty old brocade stood a large photograph of sybil merton as he had seen her first at lady knoll's ball the small exquisitely shaped head drooped slightly to one side as though the thin reed-like throat could hardly bear the burden of so much beauty the lips were slightly parted and seemed made for sweet music and all the tender purity of girlhood looked out in wonder from the dreaming eyes with her soft clinging dress of crepe de chine and her large leaf-shaped fan she looked like one of those delicate little figures men find in the olive woods near tanagra and there was a touch of greek grace in her pose and attitude yet she was not petite she was simply perfectly proportioned a rare thing in an age when so many women are either over life-size or insignificant now as lord arthur looked at her he was filled with the terrible pity that is born of love he felt that to marry her with the doom of murder hanging over his head would be a betrayal like that of judas a sin worse than any the borgia had ever dreamed of what happiness could there be for them when at any moment he might be called upon to carry out the awful prophecy written in his hand what manner of life would be theirs while fate still held this fearful fortune in the scales the marriage must be postponed at all costs of this he was quite resolved ardently though he loved the girl and a mere touch of her fingers when they sat together made each nerve of his body thrill with exquisite joy he recognised none the less clearly where his duty lay and was fully conscious of the fact that he had no right to marry until he had committed the murder this done he could stand before the altar with sybil merton and give his life into her hands without terror of wrongdoing this done he could take her to his arms knowing that she would never have to blush for him never have to hang her head in shame but done it must be first and the sooner the better for both many men in his position would have preferred the primrose path of dalliance to the steep heights of duty but lord arthur was too conscientious to set pleasure above principle there was more than mere passion in his love and sybil was to him a symbol of all that is good and noble for a moment he had a natural repugnance against what he was asked to do but it soon passed away his heart told him that it was not a sin but a sacrifice his reason reminded him that there was no other course open. He had to choose between living for himself and living for others. And terrible though the task laid upon him undoubtedly was, 
yet he knew that he must not suffer selfishness to triumph over love. Sooner or later we are all called upon to decide on the same issue. Of us all the same question is asked. To Lord Arthur it came early in life, before his nature had been spoiled by the calculating cynicism of middle age, or his heart corroded by the shallow, fashionable egotism of our day, and he felt no hesitation about doing his duty. Fortunately also for him, he was no mere dreamer or idle dilettante. Had he been so, he would have hesitated, like Hamlet, and let irresolution mar his purpose. But he was essentially practical. Life to him meant action, rather than thought. He had that rarest of all things, common sense. The wild, turbid feelings of the previous night had by this time completely passed away, and it was almost with a sense of shame that he looked back upon his mad wanderings from street to street, his fierce emotional agony. The very sincerity of his sufferings made them seem unreal to him now, he wondered how he could have been so foolish as to rant and rave about the inevitable. The only question that seemed to trouble him was, whom to make away with? For he was not blind to the fact that murder, like the religions of the pagan world, requires a victim as well as a priest. Not being a genius, he had no enemies, and indeed he felt that this was not the time for the gratification of any personal pique or dislike. The mission in which he was engaged, being one of great and grave solemnity, he accordingly made out a list of his friends and relatives on a sheet of note-paper, and after careful consideration, decided in favour of Lady Clementina Beecham, a dear old lady who lived in Curzon Street, and was his own second cousin by his mother's side. He had always been very fond of Lady Clem, as everyone called her, and as he was very wealthy himself, having come into all Lord Rugby's property when he came of age, there was no possibility of his deriving any vulgar monetary advantage by her death. In fact, the more he thought over the matter, the more she seemed to him to be just the right person, and, feeling that any delay would be unfair to Sybil, he determined to make his arrangements at once. The first thing to be done was, of course, to settle with the chiromantist, so he sat down at a small Sheraton writing-table that stood near the window, drew a cheque for one hundred and five pounds, payable to the order of Mr. Septimus Podgers, and, enclosing it in an envelope, told his valet to take it to West Moon Street. He then telephoned to the stables for his hansom, and dressed to go out. As he was leaving the room, he looked back at Sybil Merton's photograph, and swore that, come what may, he would never let her know what he was doing for her sake but would keep the secret of his self-sacrifice hidden always in his heart. On his way to the Buckingham, he stopped at a florist's and sent Sybil a beautiful basket of Narcissus, with lovely white petals and staring pheasant's eyes, and, on arriving at the club, went straight to the library, rang the bell, and ordered the waiter to bring him a lemon and soda, and a book on toxicology. He had fully decided that poison was the best means to adopt in this troublesome business. Anything like personal violence was extremely distasteful to him, and besides, he was very anxious not to murder Lady Clementina in any way that might attract public attention, as he hated the idea of being lionised at Lady Windermere's, or seeing his name figuring in the paragraphs of vulgar society, newspapers. He had also to think of Sybil's father and mother, who were rather old-fashioned people, and might possibly object to the marriage if there was anything like a scandal, though he felt certain that if he told them the whole facts of the case, they would be the very first to appreciate the motives that had actuated him. He had every reason, then, to decide in favour of poison. It was safe, sure, and quiet, and did away with any necessity for painful scenes to which like most Englishmen, he had a rooted objection. Of the science of poisons, however, he knew absolutely nothing, and as the waiter seemed quite unable to find anything in the library but rough guide and Bailey's magazine, he examined the bookshelves himself, and finally came across a handsomely bound edition of the Pharmacopoeia, 
and a copy of Erskine's Toxicology, edited by Sir Matthew Reed, the President of the Royal College of Physicians, and one of the oldest members of the Buckingham. Having been elected in mistake for somebody else, a contretemps that so enraged the committee that when the real man came up they blackballed him unanimously. Lord Arthur was a good deal puzzled at the technical terms used in both books, and had begun to regret that he had not paid more attention to his classics at Oxford. When, in the second volume of Erskine, he found a very interesting and complete account of the properties of aconitine, written in fairly clear English, it seemed to him to be exactly the poison he wanted. It was swift, indeed, almost immediate in its effect, perfectly painless, and when taken in the form of a gelatin capsule, the mode recommended by Sir Matthew, not by any means unpalatable. He accordingly made a note upon his shirt-cuff of the amount necessary for a fatal dose, put the books back in their places, and strolled up St. James's Street to Pestle and Humby's, the great chemists. Mr. Pestle, who always attended personally on the aristocracy, was a good deal surprised at the order, and in a very deferential manner murmured something about a medical certificate being necessary. However, as soon as Lord Arthur explained to him that it was for a large Norwegian mastiff that he was obliged to get rid of, as it showed signs of incipient rabies, and had already bitten the coachman twice in the calf of the leg, he expressed himself as being perfectly satisfied, complimented Lord Arthur on his wonderful knowledge of toxicology, and had the prescription made up immediately. Lord Arthur put the capsule into a pretty little silver bonbonniere that he saw in a shop window in Bond Street, threw away Pestle and Humby's ugly pill-box, and drove off at once to Lady Clementina's. "'Well, Monsieur le mauvais sujet,' cried the old lady as he entered the room, "'why haven't you been to see me all this time?' "'My dear Lady Clem, I never have a moment to myself,' said Lord Arthur, smiling. "'I suppose you mean that you go out all day long with Miss Sybil Merton, buying chiffons and talking nonsense. I cannot understand why people make such a fuss about being married. In my day we never dreamed of billing and cooing in public, or in private for that matter. I assure you I have not seen Sybil for twenty-four hours, Lady Clem. As far as I can make out, she belongs entirely to her milliners. Of course, that is the only reason you come to see an ugly old woman like myself. I wonder you men don't take warning. On a fait des folies pour moi, and here I am, a poor rheumatic creature, with a false front and a bad temper. Why, if it were not for dear Lady Jansen, who sends me all the worst French novels she can find, I don't think I could get through the day. Doctors are no use at all, except to get fees out of one. They can't even cure my heartburn. I have brought you a cure for that, Lady Clem said Lord Arthur gravely. It is a wonderful thing, invented by an American. I don't think I like American inventions, Arthur. I am quite sure I don't. I read some American novels lately, and they were quite nonsensical. Oh, but there is no nonsense at all about this, Lady Clem. I assure you, it is a perfect cure. You must promise to try it. And Lord Arthur brought a little box out of his pocket and handed it to her. "'Well, the box is charming, Arthur. Is it really a present?' "'That is very sweet of you. And is this the wonderful medicine? It looks like a bonbon. I'll take it at once.' "'Good heavens, Lady Clem!' cried Lord Arthur, catching hold of her hand. "'You mustn't do anything of the kind. It is a homeopathic medicine, and if you take it without having heartburn, it might do you no end of harm. Wait till you have an attack, and take it then.' You will be astonished at the result. I should like to take it now, said Lady Clementina, holding up to the light the little transparent capsule with its floating bubble of liquid aconitine. I am sure it is delicious. The fact is that, though I hate doctors, I love medicines. However, I'll keep it till my next attack. And when will that be? asked Lord Arthur eagerly. Will it be soon? I hope not for a week. I had a very bad time yesterday morning with it, but one never knows. 
"'You are sure to have one before the end of the month, then, Lady Clem?' "'I am afraid so. But how sympathetic you are to-day, Arthur. Really, Sybil has done you a great deal of good, and now you must run away, for I am dining with some very dull people, who won't talk scandal, and I know that if I don't get my sleep now, I shall never be able to keep awake during dinner. Good-bye, Arthur. Give my love to Sybil, and thank you so much for the American medicine.' "'You won't forget to take it, Lady Clem, will you?' said Lord Arthur, rising from his seat. "'Of course I won't, you silly boy. I think it is most kind of you to think of me, and I shall write and tell you if I want any more.' Lord Arthur left the house in high spirits, and with a feeling of immense relief. That night he had an interview with Sybil Merton. He told her how he had suddenly been placed in a position of terrible difficulty, from which neither honour nor duty would allow him to recede. He told her that the marriage must be put off for the present, as until he had got rid of his fearful entanglements, he was not a free man. He implored her to trust him, and not to have any doubts about the future. Everything would come right, but patience was necessary. The scene took place in the conservatory of Mr. Merton's house, in Park Lane, where Lord Arthur had dined as usual. Sybil had never seemed more happy, and for a moment Lord Arthur had been tempted to play the coward's part, to write to Lady Clementina for the pill, and to let the marriage go on, as if there was no such person as Mr. Podgers in the world. His better nature, however, soon asserted itself, and even when Sybil flung herself weeping into his arms, he did not falter. The beauty that stirred his senses had touched his conscience also. He felt that to wreck so fair a life for the sake of a few months' pleasure would be a wrong thing to do. He stayed with Sybil till nearly midnight, comforting her and being comforted in turn, and early the next morning he left for Venice, after writing a manly, firm letter to Mr. Merton about the necessary postponement of the marriage. CHAPTER Four. In Venice he met his brother, Lord Surbiton, who happened to have come over from Corfu in his yacht. The two young men spent a delightful fortnight together. In the morning they rode on the Lido, or glided up and down the green canals in their long black gondola. In the afternoon they usually entertained visitors on the yacht, and in the evening they dined at Florian's and smoked innumerable cigarettes on the piazza. Yet somehow Lord Arthur was not happy. Every day he studied the obituary in the Times, expecting to see a notice of Lady Clementina's death, but every day he was disappointed. He began to be afraid that some accident had happened to her, and often regretted that he had prevented her taking the aconite when she had been so anxious to try its effect. Sybil's letters, too, though full of love and trust and tenderness, were often very sad in their tone and sometimes he used to think that he was parted from her forever. After a fortnight, Lord Surbiton got bored with Venice, and determined to run down the coast to Ravenna, as he heard that there was some capital cock-shooting in the pine Eatum. Lord Arthur, at first, refused absolutely to come, but Surbiton, of whom he was extremely fond, finally persuaded him that if he stayed at Danielli's by himself, he would be moped to death and on the morning of the 15th they started with a strong nor'east wind blowing, and a rather choppy sea. The sport was excellent, and a free open-air life brought the colour back to Lord Arthur's cheek. But about the 22nd he became anxious about Lady Clementina, and, in spite of Sir Beton's remonstrances, came back to Venice by train. As he stepped out of the gondola onto the hotel steps, the proprietor came forward to meet him, with a sheaf of telegrams. Lord Arthur snatched them out of his hand and tore them open. Everything had been successful. Lady Clementina had died quite suddenly on the night of the 17th. His first thought was for Sybil, and he sent her off a telegram announcing his immediate return to London. He then ordered his valet to pack his things for the night mail, sent his gondoliers about five times their proper fare, and ran up to his sitting-room with a light step and a buoyant heart. There he found three letters waiting for him. One was from Sybil herself, 
full of sympathy and condolence. The others were from his mother, and from Lady Clementina's solicitor. It seemed that the old lady had dined with the Duchess that very night, had delighted every one by her wit and esprit, but had gone home somewhat early, complaining of heartburn. Sir Matthew Reed had been sent for at once, but, of course, there was nothing to be done, and she was to be buried on the twenty-second at Beecham Shalcott. A few days before she died, she had made her will, and left Lord Arthur her little house in Curzon Street, and all her furniture, personal effects, and pictures with the exception of her collection of miniatures, which was to go to her sister, Lady Margaret Rufford, and her amethyst necklace, which Sybil Merton was to have. The property was not of much value, but Mr. Mansfield, the solicitor, was extremely anxious for Lord Arthur to return at once, if possible, as there were a great many bills to be paid, and Lady Clementina had never kept any regular accounts. Lord Arthur was very touched by Lady Clementina's kind remembrance of him, and he felt that Mr. Podgers had a great deal to answer for. His love of Sybil, however, dominated every other emotion, and a consciousness that he had done his duty gave him peace and comfort. When he arrived at Charing Cross, he felt perfectly happy. The Mertons received him very kindly. Sybil made him promise that he would never again allow anything to come between them, and the marriage was fixed for the 7th of June. Life seemed to him once more bright and beautiful, and all his old gladness came back to him again. One day, however, as he was going over the house in Curzon Street, in company with Lady Clementina's solicitor, and Sybil herself, burning packages of faded letters, and turning out drawers of odd rubbish, the young girl suddenly gave a little cry of delight. "'What have you found, Sybil?' said Lord Arthur, looking up from his work and smiling. "'This lovely little silver bonbonniere, Arthur. Isn't it quaint and Dutch? Do give it to me. I know amethysts won't become me till I am over eighty. It was the box that had held the aconitine. Lord Arthur started, and a faint blush came into his cheek. He had almost entirely forgotten what he had done, and it seemed to him a curious coincidence that Sybil, for whose sake he had gone through all that terrible anxiety, should have been the first to remind him of it. "'Of course you can have it, Sybil. I gave it to poor Lady Clem myself.' "'Oh, thank you, Arthur. And may I have the bonbon, too? I had no notion that Lady Clementina liked sweets. I thought she was far too intellectual.' Lord Arthur grew deadly pale, and a horrible idea crossed his mind. "'Bonbon, Sybil? What do you mean?' he said in a slow, hoarse voice. "'There is one in it, that is all. It looks quite old and dusty, and I have not the slightest intention of eating it. What is the matter, Arthur? How white you look!' Lord Arthur rushed across the room and seized the box. Inside it was the amber-coloured capsule with its poisoned bubble. Lady Clementina had died a natural death after all. The shock of the discovery was almost too much for him. He flung the capsule into the fire and sank on the sofa with a cry of despair. End of section two. Chapters five and six of Lord Arthur Savile's Crime. Chapter five. Mr. Merton was a good deal distressed at the second postponement of the marriage, and Lady Julia, who had already ordered her dress for the wedding, did all in her power to make Sybil break off the match. Dearly, however, as Sybil loved her mother, she had given her whole life into Lord Arthur's hands, and nothing that Lady Julia could say could make her waver in her faith. As for Lord Arthur himself, it took him days to get over his terrible disappointment, and for a time his nerves were completely unstrung. His excellent common sense, however, soon asserted itself, and his sound practical mind did not leave him long in doubt about what to do. Poison having proved a complete failure, dynamite, or some other form of explosive, was obviously the proper thing to try. He accordingly looked again over the list of his friends and relatives, and, after careful consideration, determined to blow up his uncle, the Dean of Chichester. The Dean, who was a man of great culture and learning, was extremely fond of clocks, and had a wonderful collection of timepieces, 
ranging from the fifteenth century to the present day, and it seemed to Lord Arthur that this hobby of the good deans offered him an excellent opportunity for carrying out his scheme. Where to procure an explosive machine was, of course, quite another matter. The London Directory gave him no information on the point, and he felt that there was very little use in going to Scotland Yard about it, as they never seemed to know anything about the movements of the dynamite faction till after an explosion had taken place, and not much, even then. Suddenly he thought of his friend Ruvalov, a young Russian of very revolutionary tendencies, whom he had met at Lady Windermere's in the winter. Count Ruvalov was supposed to be writing a life of Peter the Great, and to have come over to England for the purpose of studying the documents relating to that Tsar's residence in this country as a ship carpenter. But it was generally suspected that he was a nihilist agent, and there was no doubt that the Russian embassy did not look with any favour upon his presence in London. Lord Arthur felt that he was just a man for his purpose, and drove down one morning to his lodgings in Bloomsbury to ask his advice and assistance. "'So you're taking a politic seriously,' said Count Ruvalov, when Lord Arthur had told him the object of his mission. But Lord Arthur, who hated swagger of any kind, felt bound to admit to him that he had not the slightest interest in social questions, and simply wanted the explosive machine for a purely family matter, in which no one was concerned but himself.' Count Ruvalov looked at him for some moments in amazement, and then, seeing that he was quite serious, wrote an address on a piece of paper, initialled it, and handed it to him across the table. "'Scotland Yard would give a good deal to know this address, my dear fellow.' "'They shan't have it!' cried Lord Arthur, laughing, and after shaking the young Russian warmly by the hand, he ran downstairs, examined the paper, and told the coachman to drive to Soho Square. There he dismissed him, and strolled down Greek Street till he came to a place called Bale's Court. He passed under the archway, and found himself in a curious cul-de-sac that was apparently occupied by a French laundry, as a perfect network of clothes lines was stretched across from house to house, and there was a flutter of white linen in the morning air. He walked right to the end, and knocked at a little green house. After some delay, during which every window in the court became a blurred mass of peering faces, the door was opened by a rather rough-looking foreigner, who asked him in very bad English what his business was. Lord Arthur handed him the paper Count Ruvalov had given him. When the man saw it, he bowed, and invited Lord Arthur into a very shabby front parlour on the ground floor, and in a few moments, Herr Winkelkopf, as he was called in England, bustled into the room with a very wine-stained napkin round his neck and a fork in his left hand. "'Count Ruvalov has given me an introduction to you,' said Lord Arthur, bowing, "'and I am anxious to have a short interview with you on a matter of business. "'My name is Smith, Mr. Robert Smith, "'and I want you to supply me with an explosive clock.' "'Charm to meet you, Lord Arthur,' said the genial little German, laughing. "'Don't look so alarmed. It is my duty to know everybody, "'and I remember seeing you one evening at Lady Windermere's. "'I hope her ladyship is quite well.' Do you mind sitting with me while I finish my breakfast? There is an excellent pâté, and my friends are kind enough to say that my Rhine wine is better than any they get at the German embassy. And before Lord Arthur had got over his surprise at being recognised, he found himself seated in the back room, sipping the most delicious Marco Brunner out of a pale yellow hock glass marked with the imperial monogram, and chatting in the friendliest manner possible to the famous conspirator. Explosive clocks, said Herr Winkelkopf are not very good things for foreign exportation, as even if they succeed in passing the custom house, the train service is so irregular that they usually go off before they have reached their proper destination. If, however, you want one for home use, I could supply you with an excellent article, and guarantee that you will be satisfied with the result. May I ask for whom it is intended? If it is for the police, or for anyone connected with Scotland Yard, I am afraid I cannot do anything for you. The English detectives are really our best friends. I have always found that by relying on their stupidity, we can do exactly what we like. I could not spare one of them. I assure you, said Lord Arthur, that it has nothing to do with the police at all. In fact, the clock is intended for the Dean of Chichester. Dear me, I had no idea that you felt so strongly about religion, Lord Arthur. Few young men do nowadays. I am afraid you overrate me, Herr Winkelkopf, 
said Lord Arthur, blushing. The fact is, I really know nothing about theology. It is purely a private matter, then? Purely private. Herr Winkelkopf shrugged his shoulders and left the room, returning in a few minutes with a round cake of dynamite about the size of a penny, and a pretty little French clock surmounted by an ormolu figure of liberty trampling on the hydra of despotism. Lord Arthur's face brightened up when he saw it. This is just what I want, he cried, and now tell me how it goes off. Ah, there is my secret, answered Herr Winkelkopf, contemplating his invention with a justifiable look of pride. Let me know when you wish it to explode, and I will set the machine to the moment. Well, today is Tuesday, and if you could send it off at once... That is impossible. I have a great deal of important work on hand for some friends of mine in Moscow. Still, I might send it off tomorrow. Oh, it will be quite time enough, said Lord Arthur politely, if it is delivered tomorrow night, or Thursday morning. For the moment of the explosion, say Friday, at noon exactly, the dean is always at home at that hour. Friday at noon, repeated Herr Winkelkopf, and he made a note to that effect in a large ledger that was lying on a burrow near the fireplace. And now, said Lord Arthur, rising from his seat, pray let me know how much I am in your debt. It is such a small matter, Lord Arthur, that I do not care to make any charge. The dynamite comes to seven and sixpence, the clock will be three pounds ten, the carriage about five shillings. I am only too pleased to oblige any friend of Count Ruvalov's. But your trouble, Herr Winkelkopf, oh, that is nothing. It is a pleasure to me. I do not work for money. I live entirely for my art. Lord Arthur laid down four pounds, two shillings, and sixpence on the table, and thanked the little German for his kindness, and, having succeeded, in declining an invitation to meet some anarchists at a meet-tea on the following Saturday, left the house and went off to the park. For the next two days he was in a state of the greatest excitement, and on Friday at twelve o'clock he drove down to the Buckingham to wait for news. All the afternoon the stolid hall-porter kept posting up telegrams from various parts of the country, giving results of horse-races, the verdicts in divorce-suits, the state of the weather and the like, while the tape ticked out wearisome details about an all-night sitting in the House of Commons, and a small panic on the stock exchange. At four o'clock the evening papers came in, and Lord Arthur disappeared into the library with the Pall Mall, the St. James, the Globe, and the Echo, to the immense indignation of Colonel Goodchild, who wanted to read the reports of a speech he had delivered that morning at the Mansion House, on the subject of South African missions and the advisability of having black bishops in every province, and for some reason or other had a strong prejudice against the evening news. None of the papers, however, contained even the slightest allusion to Chichester, and Lord Arthur felt that the attempt must have failed. It was a terrible blow to him, and for a time he was quite unnerved. Herr Winkelkopf, whom he went to see the next day, was full of elaborate apologies and offered to supply him with another clock free of charge, or with a case of nitroglycerine bombs, at cost price. But he had lost all faith in explosives, and Herr Winkelkopf himself acknowledged that everything is so adulterated nowadays that even dynamite can hardly be got in a pure condition. The little German, however, while admitting that something must have gone wrong with the machinery, was not without hope that the clock might still go off and instanced the case of a barometer that he had once sent to the military governor at Odessa, which, though time to explode in ten days, had not done so for something like three months. It was quite true that when it did go off, it merely succeeded in blowing a housemaid to atoms, the governor having gone out of town six weeks before. But at least it showed that dynamite, as a destructive force, was, when under the control of machinery, a powerful, though a somewhat unpunctual agent. Lord Arthur was a little consoled by this reflection, but even here he was destined to disappointment, for two days afterwards, as he was going upstairs, the Duchess called him into her boudoir and showed him a letter she had just received from the deanery. "'Jane writes charming letters,' said the Duchess. "'You must really read her last. It is quite as good as the novels Moody sends us.' Lord Arthur seized the letter from her hand. It ran as follows. 
the deanery chichester the twenty seventh of may my dearest aunt thank you so much for the flannel for the dorcas society and also for the gingham i quite agree with you that it is nonsense their wanting to wear pretty things but everybody is so radical and irreligious nowadays that it is difficult to make them see that they should not try and dress like the upper classes i am sure i don't know what we are coming to as papa has often said in his sermons we live in an age of unbelief we have had great fun over a clock that an unknown admirer sent papa last thursday it arrived in a wooden box from london carriage paid and papa feels it must have been sent by someone who had read his remarkable sermon is licensed liberty for on the top of the clock was a figure of a woman with what papa said was the cap of liberty on her head i didn't think it very becoming myself but papa said it was historical so i suppose it is all right parker unpacked it and papa put it on the mantelpiece in the library and we were all sitting there on friday morning when just as the clock struck twelve we heard a whirring noise a little puff of smoke came from the pedestal of the figure and the goddess of liberty fell off and broke her nose on the fender maria was quite alarmed but it looked so ridiculous that james and i went off into fits of laughter and even papa was amused when he examined it we found it was a sort of alarm clock and that if you set it to a particular hour and put some gunpowder and a cap under a little hammer it went off whenever you wanted papa said it must not remain in the library as it made a noise so reggie carried it away to the schoolroom and does nothing but have small explosions all day long do you think arthur would like one as a wedding present i suppose they are quite fashionable in london papa says they should do a great deal of good as they show that liberty can't last but must fall down papa says liberty was invented at the time of the french revolution how awful it seems i have now to go to the dorcas where i will read them your most instructive letter how true dear aunt your idea is that in their rank of life they should wear what is unbecoming i must say it is absurd their anxiety about dress when there are so many more important things in this world and in the next i am so glad your flowered poplin turned out so well and that your lace was not torn i am wearing my yellow satin that you so kindly gave me at the bishop's on wednesday and think it will look all right would you have bows or not jennings says that every one wears bows now and that the underskirt should be frilled reggie has just had another explosion and papa has ordered the clock to be sent to the stables i don't think papa likes it so much as he did at first though he is very flattered at being sent such a pretty and ingenious toy it shows that people read his sermons and profit by them papa sends his love in which james and reggie and maria all unite and hoping that uncle cecil's gout is better believe me my dear aunt ever your affectionate niece jane percy p s do tell me about the bows jennings insists they are the fashion lord arthur looked so serious and unhappy over the letter that the duchess went into fits of laughter my dear arthur she cried i shall never show you a young lady's letter again but what shall i say about the clock i think it is a capital invention and i should like to have one myself i don't think much of them said lord arthur with a sad smile and after kissing his mother he left the room when he got upstairs he flung himself on a sofa and his eyes filled with tears he had done his best to commit this murder but on both occasions he had failed and through no fault of his own he had tried to do his duty but it seemed as if destiny herself had turned traitor he was oppressed with the sense of the barrenness of good intentions of the futility of trying to be fine perhaps it would be better to break off the marriage altogether sybil would suffer it is true but suffering could not really mar a nature so noble as hers as for himself what did it matter there is always some war in which a man can die some cause to which a man can give his life and as life had no pleasure for him so death had no terror let destiny work out his doom he would not stir to help her at half-past seven he dressed and went down to the club surbiton was there with a party of young men and he was obliged to dine with them their trivial conversation and idle jests did not interest him and as soon as coffee was brought he left them inventing some engagement in order to get away as he was going out of the club the hall porter handed him a letter 
It was from Herr Winkelkopf, asking him to call down the next evening, and look at an exclusive umbrella that went off as soon as it was open. It was the very latest invention, and had just arrived from Geneva. He tore up the letter into fragments. He had made up his mind not to try any more experiments. Then he wandered down to the Thames Embankment, and sat for hours by the river. The moon peered through a mane of tawny clouds, as if it were a lion's eye, and innumerable stars spangled the hollow vault like gold dust powdered on a purple dome. Now and then a barge swung out into the turbid stream, and floated away with the tide, and the railway signals changed from green to scarlet as the trains ran shrieking across the bridge. After some time, twelve o'clock boomed from the tall tower at Westminster, and at each stroke of the sonorous bell the night seemed to tremble. Then the railway lights went out, one solitary lamp left gleaming like a large ruby on a giant mast, and the roar of the city became fainter. At two o'clock he got up and strolled towards Blackfriars. How unreal everything looked! How like a strange dream! The houses on the other side of the river seemed built out of darkness. One would have said that silver and shadow had fashioned the world anew. The huge dome of St. Paul's loomed like a bubble through the dusky air. As he approached Cleopatra's needle, he saw a man leaning over the parapet, and as he came nearer, the man looked up, the gas light falling upon his face. It was Mr. Podgers, the chiromantist. No one could mistake the fat flabby face, the gold-rimmed spectacles, the sickly feeble smile, the sensual mouth. Lord Arthur stopped. A brilliant idea flashed across him, and he stole softly up behind. In a moment he had seized Mr. Podgers by the legs and flung him into the Thames. There was a coarse oaf, a heavy splash, and all was still. Lord Arthur looked anxiously over, but could see nothing of the chiromantist, but a tall hat, pirouetting in an eddy of moonlit water. After a time it also sank, and no trace of Mr. Podgers was visible. Once he thought that he caught sight of the bulky misshapen figure, striking out for the staircase by the bridge, and a horrible feeling of failure came over him. But it turned out to be merely a reflection, and when the moon shone out from behind a cloud, it passed away. At last he seemed to have realised the decree of destiny. He heaved a deep sigh of relief, and Sybil's name came to his lips. "'Have you dropped anything, sir?' said a voice behind him suddenly. He turned round, and saw a policeman with a bull's-eye lantern. "'Nothing of importance, sergeant,' he answered, smiling, and hailing a passing hansom, he jumped in and told the man to drive to Belgrave Square. For the next few days he alternated between hope and fear. There were moments when he almost expected Mr. Podgers to walk into the room, and yet at other times he felt that fate could not be so unjust to him. Twice he went to the chiromantist's address in West Moon Street, but he could not bring himself to ring the bell. He longed for certainty, and was afraid of it. Finally it came. He was sitting in the smoking-room of the club, having tea, and listening rather wearily to Sir Biton's account of the last comic song at the Gaiety, when the waiter came in with the evening papers. He took up the St. James's, and was listlessly turning over its pages, when this strange heading caught his eye. Suicide of a Chiromantist. He turned pale with excitement and began to read. The paragraph ran as follows. Yesterday morning at seven o'clock, the body of Mr. Septimus R. Podgers, the eminent chiromantist, was washed on shore at Greenwich, just in front of the ship hotel. The unfortunate gentleman had been missing for some days, and considerable anxiety for his safety had been felt in chiromantic circles. It is supposed that he committed suicide under the influence of a temporary mental derangement, caused by overwork, and the verdict to that effect was returned this afternoon by the coroner's jury. Mr. Podgers had just completed an elaborate treatise on the subject of the human hand that will shortly be published, when it will no doubt attract much attention. The deceased was sixty-five years of age, and does not seem to have left any relations. Lord Arthur rushed out of the club with the paper still in his hand, to the immense amazement of the hall porter, who tried in vain to stop him, and drove at once to Park Lane. 
Sibyl saw him from the window, and something told her that he was the bearer of good news. She ran down to meet him, and when she saw his face, she knew that all was well. "'My dear Sibyl!' cried Lord Arthur. "'Let us be married to-morrow!' "'You foolish boy! Why, the cake is not even ordered!' said Sibyl, laughing through her tears. CHAPTER Six. When the wedding took place some three weeks later, St. Peter's was crowded with a perfect mob of smart people. The service was read in the most impressive manner by the Dean of Chichester, and everybody agreed that they had never seen a handsomer couple than the bride and bridegroom. They were more than handsome, however. They were happy. Never for a single moment did Lord Arthur regret all that he had suffered for Sibyl's sake, while she, on her side, gave him the best things a woman can give to any man, worship, tenderness, and love. For them, romance was not killed by reality. They always felt young. Some years afterwards, when two beautiful children had been born to them, Lady Windermere came down on a visit to Alton Priory, a lovely old place that had been the Duke's wedding present to his son. And one afternoon, as she was sitting with Lady Arthur, under a lime tree in the garden, watching little boy and girl as they played up and down the rose-walk, like fitful sunbeams. She suddenly took her hostess's hand in hers, and said, "'Are you happy, Sybil?' "'Dear Lady Windermere, of course I am very happy. Aren't you?' "'I have no time to be happy, Sybil. I always like the last person who is introduced to me, but as a rule, as soon as I know people, I get tired of them.' "'Don't your lion satisfy you, Lady Windermere?' "'Oh, dear, no! Lions are only good for one season. "'As soon as their manes are cut, they are the dullest creatures going. "'Besides, they behave very badly if you are really nice to them. "'Do you remember that horrid Mr. Podgers? "'He was a dreadful impostor. "'Of course I didn't mind that at all, "'and even when he wanted to borrow money, I forgave him, "'but I could not stand his making love to me.' He has really made me hate chiromancy. I go in for telepathy now. It is much more amusing. You mustn't say anything against chiromancy here, Lady Windermere. It is the only subject that Arthur does not like people to chaff about. I assure you, he is quite serious over it. You don't mean to say he believes in it, Sybil? Ask him, Lady Windermere. Here he is and Lord Arthur came up the garden with a large bunch of yellow roses in his hand, and his two children dancing round him. "'Lord Arthur?' "'Yes, Lady Windermere. You don't mean to say that you believe in chiromancy?' "'Of course I do,' said the young man, smiling. "'But why?' "'Because I owe it all the happiness of my life,' he murmured, throwing himself into a wicker chair. "'My dear Lord Arthur, what do you owe to it?' "'Sibyl,' he answered, handing his wife the roses, and looking into her violet eyes. "'What nonsense!' cried Lady Windermere. "'I have never heard such nonsense in all my life!' End of Section 3 End of Lord Arthur Savile's Crime Section 4 Chapter One, The Canterville Ghost, a Hilo Idealistic Romance. When Mr. Hiram B. Otis, the American minister, bought Canterville Chase, everyone told him he was doing a very foolish thing, as there was no doubt at all that the place was haunted. Indeed, Lord Canterville himself, who was a man of the most punctilious honor, had felt it his duty to mention the fact to Mr. Otis when they came to discuss terms. "'We have not cared to live in the place ourselves,' said Lord Canterville, "'since my grand-aunt, the dowager Duchess of Bolton, "'was frightened into a fit from which she never really recovered "'by two skeleton hands being placed on her shoulders "'as she was dressing for dinner. "'And I feel bound to tell you, Mr. Otis, "'that the ghost has been seen by several living members of my family, "'as well as by the rector of the parish, "'the Reverend Augustus Dampier, "'who was a fellow of King's College, Cambridge.' After the unfortunate accident to the Duchess, none of our younger servants would stay with us, and Lady Canterville often got very little sleep at night, in consequence of the mysterious noises that came from the corridor and the library. 
"'My lord,' answered the minister, "'I will take the furniture and the ghost at a valuation. "'I come from a modern country where we have everything that money can buy, "'and with all our spry young fellows painting the old world red "'and carrying off your best actresses and prima donnas, "'I reckon that if there were such a thing as a ghost in Europe, "'we'd have it at home in a very short time "'in one of our public museums or on the road as a show.' "'I fear that the ghost exists,' said Lord Canterville, smiling, "'though it may have resisted the overtures of your enterprising impresarios. "'It has been well known for three centuries, since 1584, in fact, "'and always makes its appearance before the death of any member of our family. "'Well, so does the family doctor, for that matter, Lord Canterville. "'But there is no such thing, sir, as the ghost.' and I guess the laws of nature are not going to be suspended for the British aristocracy. "'You certainly are very natural in America,' answered Lord Canterville, who did not quite understand Mr. Otis's last observation. "'And if you don't mind a ghost in the house, it is all right. Only you must remember I warned you.' A few weeks after this, the purchase was completed, and at the close of the season the minister and his family went down to Canterville Chase. Mrs. Otis, who, as Miss Lucretia R. Tappan of West 53rd Street, had been a celebrated New York belle, was now a very handsome middle-aged woman with fine eyes and a superb profile. Many American ladies on leaving their native land adopt an appearance of chronic ill health under the impression that it is a form of European refinement, but Mrs. Otis had never fallen into this error. She had a magnificent constitution and a really wonderful amount of animal spirits. Indeed, in many respects, she was quite English, and was an excellent example of the fact that we have really everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language. Her eldest son, christened Washington by his parents in a moment of patriotism, which he never ceased to regret, was a fair-haired, rather good-looking young man who had qualified himself for American diplomacy by leading the German at the Newport Casino, for three successive seasons, and even in London was well known as an excellent dancer. Gardenias and the peerage were his only weaknesses. Otherwise he was extremely sensible. Miss Virginia E. Otis was a little girl of fifteen, lithe and lovely as a fawn, and with a fine freedom in her large blue eyes. She was a wonderful Amazon, and had once raced old Lord Bilton on her pony twice round the park winning by a length and a half just in front of the achilles statue to the huge delight of the young duke of cheshire who proposed for her on the spot and was sent back to eton that very night by his guardians in floods of tears after virginia came the twins who were usually called the stars and stripes as they were always getting swished they were delightful boys and with the exception of the worthy minister the only true republicans of the family as Canterville Chase is seven miles from Ascot, the nearest railway station, Mr. Otis had telegraphed for a wagonette to meet them, and they started on their drive in high spirits. It was a lovely July evening, and the air was delicate with the scent of the pine woods. Now and then they heard a wood pigeon brooding over its own sweet voice, or saw, deep in the rustling fern, the burnished breast of the pheasant. Little squirrels peered at them from the beech trees as they went by, and the rabbits scudded away through the brushwood and over the mossy knolls with their white tails in the air. As they entered the avenue of Canterville Chase, however, the sky became suddenly overcast with clouds. A curious stillness seemed to hold the atmosphere. A great flight of rooks passed silently over their heads, and before they reached the house, some big drops of rain had fallen. Standing on the steps to receive them was an old woman, neatly dressed in black silk, with a white cap and apron. This was Mrs. Umney, the housekeeper, whom Mrs. Otis, at Lady Canterville's earnest request, had consented to keep on in her former position. She made them each a low curtsy as they alighted, and said in a quaint, old-fashioned manner, I bid you welcome to Canterville Chase. Following her, they passed through the fine Tudor Hall into the library, a long, low room, panelled in black oak, at the end of which was a large stained-glass window. Here they found tea laid out for them, and after taking off their wraps, they sat down and began to look round, 
while Mrs. Umney waited on them. Suddenly Mrs. Otis caught sight of a dull red stain on the floor just by the fireplace, and quite unconscious of what it really signified, said to Mrs. Umney, "'I'm afraid something has been spilt there.' "'Yes, madam,' replied the old housekeeper in a low voice. "'Blood has been spilt on that spot.' "'How horrid!' cried Mrs. Otis. "'I don't at all care for bloodstains in a sitting-room. It must be removed at once.' The old woman smiled and answered in the same low, mysterious voice, "'It is the blood of Lady Eleanor de Canterville, who was murdered on that very spot by her own husband, Sir Simon de Canterville, in 1575. Sir Simon survived her nine years, and disappeared suddenly, under very mysterious circumstances. His body has never been discovered, but his guilty spirit still haunts the chase.' The bloodstain has been much admired by tourists and others, and cannot be removed. "'That's all nonsense,' cried Washington Otis. "'Pinkerton's champion stain remover and paragon detergent will clean it up in no time.' And before the terrified housekeeper could interfere, he had fallen upon his knees and was rapidly scouring the floor with a small stick of what looked like a black cosmetic. In a few moments no trace of the bloodstain could be seen. "'I knew Pinkerton would do it,' he exclaimed triumphantly, as he looked round at his admiring family. But no sooner had he said these words than a terrible flash of lightning lit up the sombre room. A fearful peal of thunder made them all start to their feet, and Mrs. Umney fainted. "'What a monstrous climate,' said the American minister calmly, as he lit a long cheroot. I guess the old country is so overpopulated that they have not enough decent weather for everybody. I have always been of opinion that immigration is the only thing for England. My dear Hiram, cried Mrs. Otis, what can we do with a woman who faints? Charge it to her, like breakages, answered the minister. She won't faint after that. And in a few moments Mrs. Umney certainly came to. There was no doubt, however, that she was extremely upset and she sternly warned Mr. Otis to beware of some trouble coming to the house. "'I have seen things with my own eyes, sir,' she said, "'that would make any Christian's hair stand on end, "'and many and many a night I have not closed my eyes in sleep "'for the awful things that are done here.' Mr. Otis, however, and his wife, warmly assured the honest soul that they were not afraid of ghosts, and after invoking the blessings of providence on her new master and mistress and making arrangements for an increase of salary the old housekeeper tottered off to her own room chapter two the storm raged fiercely all that night but nothing of particular note occurred the next morning however when they came down to breakfast they found the terrible stain of blood once again on the floor "'I don't think it can be the fault of the Paragon detergent,' said Washington, "'for I have tried it with everything. It must be the ghost.' He accordingly rubbed out the stain a second time. But the second morning it appeared again. The third morning also it was there, though the library had been locked up at night by Mr. Otis himself, and the key carried upstairs. The whole family were now quite interested.' Mr. Otis began to suspect that he had been too dogmatic in his denial of the existence of ghosts. Mrs. Otis expressed her intention of joining the Psychical Society, and Washington prepared a long letter to Messrs. Myers and Podmore on the subject of the permanence of sanguinous stains when connected with crime. That night, all doubts about the objective existence of phantasmata were removed forever. The day had been warm and sunny, and in the cool of the evening the whole family went out for a drive. They did not return home till nine o'clock, when they had a light supper. The conversation in no way turned upon ghosts, so there were not even those primary conditions of receptive expectation which so often precede the presentation of psychical phenomena. The subjects discussed, as I have since learned from Mr. Otis, were merely such as form the ordinary conversation of cultured Americans of the better class such as the immense superiority of Miss Fanny Davenport over Sarah Bernhardt as an actress, the difficulty of obtaining green corn, buckwheat cakes and hominy 
even in the best english houses the importance of boston in the development of the world's soul the advantages of the baggage check system in railway travelling and the sweetness of the new york accent as compared to the london drawl no mention at all was made of the supernatural nor was sir simon de canterville alluded to in any way at eleven o'clock the family retired and by half past all the lights were out some time after mr otis was awakened by a curious noise in the corridor outside his room it sounded like the clank of metal and seemed to be coming nearer every moment he got up at once struck a match and looked at the time it was exactly one o'clock he was quite calm and felt his pulse which was not at all feverish the strange noise still continued and with it he heard distinctly the sound of footsteps he put on his slippers took a small oblong file out of his dressing case and opened the door right in front of him he saw in the wan moonlight an old man of terrible aspect his eyes were as red burning coals long gray hair fell over his shoulders in matted coils his garments which were of antique cut were soiled and ragged and from his wrists and ankles hung heavy manacles and rusty jives my dear sir said mr otis i really must insist on your oiling those chains and have brought you for that purpose a small bottle of the tammany rising sun lubricator it is said to be completely efficacious upon one application and there are several testimonials to that effect on the wrapper from some of our most eminent native divines i shall leave it here for you by the bedroom candles and will be happy to supply you with more should you require it with these words the united states minister laid the bottle down on a marble table and closing his door retired to rest for a moment the canterville ghost stood quite motionless in natural indignation then dashing the bottle violently upon the polished floor he fled down the corridor uttering hollow groans and emitting a ghastly green light just however as he reached the top of the great oak staircase a door was flung open two little white-robed figures appeared and a large pillow whizzed past his head there was evidently no time to be lost so hastily adopting the fourth dimension of space as a means of escape he vanished through the wainscoting and the house became quite quiet on reaching a small secret chamber in the left wing he leaned up against a moonbeam to recover his breath and began to try and realize his position never in a brilliant and uninterrupted career of three hundred years had he been so grossly insulted he thought of the dowager duchess whom he had frightened into a fit as she stood before the glass in her lace and diamonds of the four housemaids who had gone off into hysterics when he merely grinned at them through the curtains of one of the spare bedrooms of the rector of the parish whose candle he had blown out as he was coming late one night from the library and who had been under the care of sir william gull ever since a perfect martyr to nervous disorders and of old madame de tremolac who having wakened up one morning early and seen a skeleton seated in an armchair by the fire reading her diary had been confined to her bed for six weeks with an attack of brain fever and on her recovery had become reconciled to the church and broken off her connection with that notorious skeptic monsieur de voltaire he remembered the terrible night when the wicked lord canterville was found choking in his dressing-room with the knave of diamonds halfway down his throat and confessed just before he died that he had cheated charles james fox out of fifty thousand pounds at crockford's by means of that very card and swore that the ghost had made him swallow it all his great achievements came back to him again from the butler who had shot himself in the pantry because he had seen a green hand tapping at the window-pane to the beautiful lady stutfield who was always obliged to wear a black velvet band round her throat to hide the mark of five fingers burnt upon her white skin and who drowned herself at last in the carp pond at the end of the king's walk with the enthusiastic egotism of the true artist he went over his most celebrated performances and smiled bitterly to himself as he recalled to mind his last appearance as red reuben or the strangled babe his debut as gaunt gibeon the bloodsucker of bexley moor 
and the furor he had excited one lovely june evening by merely playing ninepins with his own bones upon the lawn tennis ground and after all this some wretched modern americans were to come and offer him the rising sun lubricator and throw pillows at his head it was quite unbearable besides no ghosts in history had ever been treated in this manner accordingly he determined to have vengeance and remained till daylight in an attitude of deep thought end of section four section five the canterville ghost a hilo idealistic romance chapter three the next morning when the otis family met at breakfast they discussed the ghost at some length the united states minister was naturally a little annoyed to find that his present had not been accepted i have no wish he said to do the ghost any personal injury and i must say that considering the length of time he has been in the house i don't think it is at all polite to throw pillows at him a very just remark at which i am sorry to say the twins burst into shouts of laughter upon the other hand he continued if he really declines to use the rising sun lubricator we shall have to take his chains from him it would be quite impossible to sleep with such a noise going on outside the bedrooms for the rest of the week however they were undisturbed the only thing that excited any attention being the continual renewal of the bloodstain on the library floor this certainly was very strange as the door was always locked at night by mr otis and the windows kept closely barred the chameleon-like color also of the stain excited a good deal of comment some mornings it was a dull almost indian red then it was vermilion then a rich purple and once when they came down for family prayers according to the simple rites of the free american reformed episcopalian church they found it a bright emerald green these kaleidoscopic changes naturally amused the party very much and bets on the subject were freely made every evening the only person who did not enter into the joke was little virginia who for some unexplained reason was always a good deal distressed at the sight of the bloodstain and very nearly cried the morning it was emerald green the second appearance of the ghost was on sunday night shortly after they had gone to bed they were suddenly alarmed by a fearful crash in the hall rushing downstairs they found that a large suit of old armor had become detached from its stand and had fallen on the stone floor while seated in a high-backed chair was the canterville ghost rubbing his knees with an expression of acute agony on his face the twins having brought their pea-shooters with them at once discharged two pellets on him with that accuracy of aim which can only be attained by long and careful practice on a writing master while the united states minister covered him with his revolver and called upon him in accordance with californian etiquette to hold up his hands the ghost started up with a wild shriek of rage and swept through them like a mist extinguishing washington otis's candle as he passed and so leaving them all in total darkness on reaching the top of the staircase he recovered himself and determined to give his celebrated peal of demoniac laughter this he had on more than one occasion found extremely useful it was said to have turned lord raker's wig gray in a single night and had certainly made three of lady canterville's french governesses give warning before their month was up he accordingly laughed his most horrible laugh till the old vaulted roof rang and rang again but hardly had the fearful echo died away when a door opened and mrs otis came out in a light blue dressing gown i am afraid you are far from well she said and have brought you a bottle of dr dobble's tincture if it is indigestion you will find it a most excellent remedy the ghost glared at her in fury and began at once to make preparations for turning himself into a large black dog an accomplishment for which he was justly renowned and to which the family doctors always attributed the permanent idiocy of lord canterville's uncle the hon thomas horton the sound of approaching footsteps however made him hesitate in his fell purpose so he contented himself with becoming faintly phosphorescent and vanished with a deep churchyard groan just as the twins had come up to him 
on reaching his room he entirely broke down and became a prey to the most violent agitation the vulgarity of the twins and the gross materialism of mrs otis were naturally extremely annoying but what really distressed him most was that he had been unable to wear the suit of mail he had hoped that even modern americans would be thrilled by the sight of a spectre in armor if for no more sensible reason at least out of respect for the national poet longfellow over whose graceful and attractive poetry he himself had whiled away many a weary hour when the cantervilles were up in town besides it was his own suit he had worn it with great success at the kenilworth tournament and had been highly complimented on it by no less a person than the virgin queen herself yet when he had put it on he had been completely overpowered by the weight of the huge breastplate and steel cask and had fallen heavily on the stone pavement barking both his knees severely and bruising the knuckles of his right hand for some days after this he was extremely ill and hardly stirred out of his room at all except to keep the bloodstain in proper repair however by taking great care of himself he recovered and resolved to make a third attempt to frighten the united states minister and his family he selected friday the seventeenth of august for his appearance and spent most of that day in looking over his wardrobe ultimately deciding in favor of a large slouched hat with a red feather a winding sheet frilled at the wrists and neck and a rusty dagger towards evening a violent storm of rain came on and the wind was so high that all the windows and doors in the old house shook and rattled in fact it was just such weather as he loved his plan of action was this he was to make his way quietly to washington otis's room gibber at him from the foot of the bed and stab himself three times in the throat to the sound of slow music he bore washington a special grudge being quite aware that it was he who was in the habit of removing the famous canterville bloodstain by means of pinkerton's paragon detergent having reduced the reckless and foolhardy youth to a condition of abject terror he was then to proceed to the room occupied by the united states minister and his wife and there to place a clammy hand on mrs otis's forehead while he hissed into her trembling husband's ear the awful secrets of the charnel house with regard to little virginia he had not quite made up his mind she had never insulted him in any way and was pretty and gentle a few hollow groans from the wardrobe he thought would be more than sufficient or if that failed to wake her he might grabble at the counterpane with palsy twitching fingers as for the twins he was quite determined to teach them a lesson the first thing to be done was of course to sit upon their chests so as to produce the stifling sensation of nightmare then as their beds were quite close to each other to stand between them in the form of a green icy cold corpse till they became paralyzed with fear and finally to throw off the winding sheet and crawl round the room with white bleached bones and one rolling eyeball in the character of dumb daniel or the suicide skeleton a role in which he had on more than one occasion produced a great effect and which he considered quite equal to his famous part of martin the maniac or the masked mystery at half past ten he heard the family going to bed for some time he was disturbed by wild shrieks of laughter from the twins who with the light-hearted gaiety of schoolboys were evidently amusing themselves before they retired to rest but at a quarter past eleven all was still and as midnight sounded he sallied forth the owl beat against the window panes the raven croaked from the old yew tree and the wind wandered moaning round the house like a lost soul but the otis family slept unconscious of their doom and high above the rain and storm he could hear the steady snoring of the minister for the united states he stepped stealthily out of the wainscoting with an evil smile on his cruel wrinkled mouth and the moon hid her face in a cloud as he stole past the great oriel window where his own arms and those of his murdered wife were blazoned in azure and gold on and on he glided like an evil shadow the very darkness seeming to loathe him as he passed once he thought he heard something call and stopped but it was only the baying of a dog from the red farm and he went on muttering strange sixteenth-century curses 
and ever and anon brandishing the rusty dagger in the midnight air finally he reached the corner of the passage that led to luckless washington's room for a moment he paused there the wind blowing his long gray locks about his head and twisting into grotesque and fantastic folds the nameless horror of the dead man's shroud then the clock struck the quarter and he felt the time was come he chuckled to himself and turned the corner but no sooner had he done so than with a piteous wail of terror he fell back and hid his blanched face in his long bony hands right in front of him was standing a horrible spectre motionless as a carven image and monstrous as a madman's dream its head was bald and burnished its face round and fat and white and hideous laughter seemed to have writhed its features into an eternal grin from the eyes streamed rays of scarlet light the mouth was a wide well of fire and a hideous garment like to his own swathed with its silent snows the titan form on its breast was a placard with strange writing in antique characters some scroll of shame it seemed some record of wild sins some awful calendar of crime and with its right hand it bore aloft a falchion of gleaming steel never having seen a ghost before he naturally was terribly frightened and after a second hasty glance at the awful phantom he fled back to his room tripping up in his long winding sheet as he sped down the corridor and finally dropping the rusty dagger into the minister's jack-boots where it was found in the morning by the butler once in the privacy of his own apartment he flung himself down on a small pallet bed and hid his face under the clothes after a time however the brave old canterville spirit asserted itself and he determined to go and speak to the other ghost as soon as it was daylight accordingly just as the dawn was touching the hills with silver he returned towards the spot where he had first laid eyes on the grisly phantom feeling that after all two ghosts were better than one and that by the aid of his new friend he might safely grapple with the twins on reaching the spot however a terrible sight met his gaze something had evidently happened to the spectre for the light had entirely faded from its hollow eyes the gleaming falchion had fallen from its hand and it was leaning up against the wall in a strained and uncomfortable attitude he rushed forward and seized it in his arms when to his horror the head slipped off and rolled on the floor the body assumed a recumbent posture and he found himself clasping a white dimity bed curtain with a sweeping brush a kitchen cleaver and a hollow turnip lying at his feet unable to understand this curious transformation he clutched the placard with feverish haste and there in the gray morning light he read these fearful words ye old ghost ye only true and original spook beware of ye imitations all others are counterfeit the whole thing flashed across him he had been tricked foiled and outwitted the old canterville look came into his eyes he ground his toothless gums together and raising his withered hands high above his head swore according to the picturesque phraseology of the antique school that when chanticleer had sounded twice his merry horn deeds of blood would be wrought and murder walk abroad with silent feet hardly had he finished this awful oath when from the red-tiled roof of a distant homestead a cock crew he laughed a long low bitter laugh and waited hour after hour he waited but the cock for some strange reason did not crow again finally at half past seven the arrival of the housemaids made him give up his fearful vigil and he stalked back to his room thinking of his vain hope and baffled purpose there he consulted several books of ancient chivalry of which he was exceedingly fond and found that on every occasion on which his oath had been used chanticleer had always crowed a second time perdition seized the naughty fowl he muttered i have seen the day when with my stout spear i would have run him through the gorge and made him crow for me and twer in death he then retired to a comfortable lead coffin and stayed there till evening chapter four 
the next day the ghost was very weak and tired the terrible excitement of the last four weeks was beginning to have its effect his nerves were completely shattered and he started at the slightest noise for five days he kept his room and at last made up his mind to give up the point of the blood stain on the library floor if the otis family did not want it they clearly did not deserve it they were evidently people on a low material plane of existence and quite incapable of appreciating the symbolic value of sensuous phenomena the question of phantasmic apparitions and the development of astral bodies was of course quite a different matter and really not under his control it was his solemn duty to appear in the corridor once a week and to gibber from the large oriel window on the first and third wednesday in every month and he did not see how he could honorably escape from his obligations it is quite true that his life had been very evil but upon the other hand he was most conscientious in all things connected with the supernatural for the next three saturdays accordingly he traversed the corridor as usual between midnight and three o'clock taking every possible precaution against being either heard or seen he removed his boots trod as lightly as possible on the old worm-eaten boards wore a large black velvet cloak and was careful to use the rising sun lubricator for oiling his chains i am bound to acknowledge that it was with a good deal of difficulty that he brought himself to adopt this last mode of protection however one night while the family were at dinner he slipped into mr otis's bedroom and carried off the bottle he felt a little humiliated at first but afterwards was sensible enough to see that there was a great deal to be said for the invention and to a certain degree it served his purpose still in spite of everything he was not left unmolested strings were continually being stretched across the corridor over which he tripped in the dark and on one occasion while dressed for the part of black isaac or the huntsman of hoagley woods he met with a severe fall through treading on a butter slide which the twins had constructed from the entrance of the tapestry chamber to the top of the oak staircase this last insult so enraged him that he resolved to make one final effort to assert his dignity and social position and determined to visit the insolent young etonians the next night in his celebrated character of reckless rupert or the headless earl he had not appeared in this disguise for more than seventy years in fact not since he had so frightened pretty lady barbara modish by means of it that she suddenly broke off her engagement with the present lord canterville's grandfather and ran away to gretna green with handsome jack castleton declaring that nothing in the world would induce her to marry into a family that allowed such a horrible phantom to walk up and down the terrace at twilight poor jack was afterwards shot in a duel by lord canterville on wandsworth common and lady barbara died of a broken heart at tunbridge wells before the year was out so in every way it had been a great success it was however an extremely difficult make-up if i may use such a theatrical expression in connection with one of the greatest mysteries of the supernatural or to employ a more scientific term the higher natural world and it took him fully three hours to make his preparations at last everything was ready and he was very pleased with his appearance the big leather riding boots that went with the dress were just a little too large for him and he could only find one of the two horse pistols but on the whole he was quite satisfied and at a quarter past one he glided out of the wainscoting and crept down the corridor on reaching the room occupied by the twins which i should mention was called the blue bed chamber on account of the color of its hangings he found the door just ajar wishing to make an effective entrance he flung it wide open when a heavy jug of water fell right down on him wetting him to the skin and just missing his left shoulder by a couple of inches at the same moment he heard stifled shrieks of laughter proceeding from the four-post bed the shock to his nervous system was so great that he fled back to his room as hard as he could go and the next day he was laid up with a severe cold the only thing that at all consoled him in the whole affair was the fact that he had not brought his head with him for had he done so the consequences might have been very serious he now gave up all hope of ever frightening this rude american family 
and contented himself as a rule with creeping about the passages in list slippers with a thick red muffler round his throat for fear of draughts and a small arquebus in case he should be attacked by the twins the final blow he received occurred on the nineteenth of september he had gone downstairs to the great entrance hall feeling sure that there at any rate he would be quite unmolested and was amusing himself by making satirical remarks on the large Cerrone photographs of the United States minister and his wife, which had now taken the place of the Canterville family pictures. He was simply but neatly clad in a long shroud, spotted with churchyard mould, had tied up his jaw with a strip of yellow linen, and carried a small lantern and a sexton's spade. In fact, he was dressed for the character of Jonas the Graveless, or the corpse-snatcher of Chertsey Barn, one of his most remarkable impersonations, and one which the Cantervilles had every reason to remember, as it was the real origin of their quarrel with their neighbor, Lord Ruford. It was about a quarter past two o'clock in the morning, and as far as he could ascertain, no one was stirring. As he was strolling towards the library, however, to see if there were any traces left of the bloodstain, suddenly there leaped out on him from a dark corner two figures who waved their arms wildly above their heads and shrieked out boo in his ear seized with a panic which under the circumstances was only natural he rushed for the staircase but found washington otis waiting for him there with the big garden syringe and being thus hemmed in by his enemies on every side and driven almost to bay he vanished into the great iron stove which fortunately for him was not lit and had to make his way home through the flues and chimneys arriving at his own room in a terrible state of dirt disorder and despair after this he was not seen again on any nocturnal expedition the twins lay in wait for him on several occasions and strewed the passages with nutshells every night to the great annoyance of their parents and the servants but it was of no avail it was quite evident that his feelings were so wounded that he would not appear. Mr. Otis consequently resumed his great work on the history of the Democratic Party, on which he had been engaged for some years. Mrs. Otis organized a wonderful clam-bake, which amazed the whole county. The boys took to lacrosse, euchre, poker, and other American national games, and Virginia rode about the lanes on her pony, accompanied by the young Duke of Cheshire who had come to spend the last week of his holidays at canterville chase it was generally assumed that the ghost had gone away and in fact mr otis wrote a letter to that effect to lord canterville who in reply expressed his great pleasure at the news and sent his best congratulations to the minister's worthy wife the otises however were deceived for the ghost was still in the house and though now almost an invalid was by no means ready to let matters rest particularly as he heard that among the guests was the young duke of cheshire whose grand-uncle lord francis stilton had once bet a hundred guineas with colonel carberry that he would play dice with the canterville ghost and was found the next morning lying on the floor of the card-room in such a helpless paralytic state that though he lived on to a great age he was never able to say anything again but double sixes the story was well known at the time though of course out of respect to the feelings of the two noble families every attempt was made to hush it up and a full account of all the circumstances connected with it will be found in the third volume of lord tattle's recollections of the prince regent and his friends the ghost then was naturally very anxious to show that he had not lost his influence over the stiltons with whom indeed he was distantly connected his own first cousin having been married on seconds noces to the sieur de bulkeley from whom as every one knows the dukes of cheshire are lineally descended accordingly he made arrangements for appearing to virginia's little lover in his celebrated impersonation of the vampire monk or the bloodless benedictine a performance so horrible that when old lady startup saw it which she did on one fatal new year's eve in the year seventeen sixty four she went off into the most piercing shrieks which culminated in violent apoplexy and died in three days after disinheriting the cantervilles who were her nearest relations and leaving all her money to her london apothecary at the last moment however his terror of the twins prevented his leaving his room 
and the little duke slept in peace under the great feathered canopy in the royal bedchamber and dreamed of virginia chapter five a few days after this virginia and her curly-haired cavalier went out riding on brockley meadows where she tore her habit so badly in getting through a hedge that on her return home she made up her mind to go up by the back staircase so as not to be seen as she was running past the tapestry chamber the door of which happened to be open she fancied she saw someone inside and thinking it was her mother's maid who sometimes used to bring her work there looked in to ask her to mend her habit to her immense surprise however it was the canterville ghost himself he was sitting by the window watching the ruined gold of the yellowing trees fly through the air and the red leaves dancing madly down the long avenue his head was leaning on his hand and his whole attitude was one of extreme depression indeed so forlorn and so much out of repair did he look that little virginia whose first idea had been to run away and lock herself in her room was filled with pity and determined to try and comfort him so light was her footfall and so deep his melancholy that he was not aware of her presence till she spoke to him i am so sorry for you she said but my brothers are going back to eton to-morrow and then if you behave yourself no one will annoy you it is absurd asking me to behave myself he answered looking round in astonishment at the pretty little girl who had ventured to address him quite absurd i must rattle my chains and groan through keyholes and walk about at night if that is what you mean it is my only reason for existing it is no reason at all for existing and you know you have been very wicked mrs umney told us the first day we arrived here that you had killed your wife well i quite admit it said the ghost petulantly but it was a purely family matter and concerned no one else it is very wrong to kill any one said virginia who at times had a sweet puritan gravity caught from some old new england ancestor oh i hate the cheap severity of abstract ethics my wife was very plain never had my ruffs properly starched and knew nothing about cookery why there was a buck i had shot in hogley woods a magnificent pricket and do you know how she had it sent up to table however it is no matter now for it is all over and i don't think it was very nice of her brothers to starve me to death though i did kill her starve you to death oh mr ghost i mean sir simon are you hungry i have a sandwich in my case would you like it no thank you i never eat anything now but it is very kind of you all the same and you are much nicer than the rest of your horrid rude vulgar dishonest family stop cried virginia stamping her foot it is you who are rude and horrid and vulgar and as for dishonesty you know you stole the paints out of my box to try and furbish up that ridiculous bloodstain in the library first you took all my reds including the vermilion and i couldn't do any more sunsets then you took the emerald green and the chrome yellow and finally i had nothing left but indigo and chinese white and could only do moonlight scenes which are always depressing to look at and not at all easy to paint i never told on you though i was very much annoyed and it was most ridiculous the whole thing for who ever heard of emerald green blood well really said the ghost rather meekly what was i to do it is a very difficult thing to get real blood nowadays and as your brother began it all with his paragon detergent i certainly saw no reason why i should not have your paints as for color that is always a matter of taste the cantervilles have blue blood for instance the very bluest in england but i know you americans don't care for things of this kind you know nothing about it and the best thing you can do is to emigrate and improve your mind my father will be only too happy to give you a free passage and though there is a heavy duty on spirits of every kind there will be no difficulty about the custom house as the officers are all democrats once in new york you are sure to be a great success i know lots of people there who would give a hundred thousand dollars to have a grandfather and much more than that to have a family ghost i don't think i should like america i suppose because we have no ruins and no curiosities said virginia satirically 
no ruins no curiosities answered the ghost you have your navy and your manners good evening i will go and ask papa to get the twins an extra week's holiday please don't go miss virginia he cried i am so lonely and so unhappy and i really don't know what to do i want to go to sleep and i cannot that's quite absurd you have merely to go to bed and blow out the candle it is very difficult sometimes to keep awake especially at church but there is no difficulty at all about sleeping why even babies know how to do that and they are not very clever i have not slept for three hundred years he said sadly and virginia's beautiful blue eyes opened in wonder for three hundred years i have not slept and i'm so tired virginia grew quite grave and her little lips trembled like rose leaves she came towards him and kneeling down at his side looked up into his old withered face poor poor ghost she murmured have you no place where you can sleep far away beyond the pine woods he answered in a low dreamy voice there is a little garden there the grass grows long and deep there are the great white stars of the hemlock flower there the nightingale sings all night long all night long he sings and the cold crystal moon looks down and the yew tree spreads out its giant arms over the sleepers virginia's eyes grew dim with tears and she hid her face in her hands you mean the garden of death she whispered yes death death must be so beautiful to lie in the soft brown earth with the grasses waving above one's head and listen to silence to have no yesterday and no tomorrow to forget time to forgive life to be at peace you can help me you can open for me the portals of death's house for love is always with you and love is stronger than death is virginia trembled a cold shudder ran through her and for a few moments there was silence she felt as if she was in a terrible dream then the ghost spoke again and his voice sounded like the sighing of the wind have you ever read the old prophecy on the library window oh often cried the little girl looking up i know it quite well it is painted in curious black letters and it is difficult to read there are only six lines when a golden girl can win prayer from out the lips of sin when the barren almond bears and the little child gives away its tears then shall all the house be still and peace come to canterville but i don't know what they mean they mean he said sadly that you must weep for me for my sins because i have no tears and pray for me for my soul because i have no faith and then if you have always been sweet and good and gentle the angel of death will have mercy on me you will see fearful shapes in darkness and wicked voices will whisper in your ear but they will not harm you for against the purity of a little child the powers of hell cannot prevail virginia made no answer and the ghost wrung his hands in wild despair as he looked down at her bowed golden head suddenly she stood up very pale and with a strange light in her eyes i am not afraid she said firmly and i will ask the angel to have mercy on you he rose from his seat with a faint cry of joy and taking her hand bent over it with old-fashioned grace and kissed it his fingers were as cold as ice and his lips burned like fire but virginia did not falter as he led her across the dusky room on the faded green tapestry were broidered little huntsmen they blew their tasseled horns and with their tiny hands waved to her to go back go back little virginia they cried go back but the ghost clutched her hand more tightly and she shut her eyes against them horrible animals with lizard tails and goggle eyes blinked at her from the carven chimney-piece and murmured beware little virginia beware we may never see you again but the ghost glided on swiftly and virginia did not listen when they reached the end of the room he stopped and muttered some words she could not understand she opened her eyes and saw the wall slowly fading away like a mist and a great black cavern in front of her a bitter cold wind swept round them 
and she felt something pulling at her dress quick quick cried the ghost or it will be too late and in a moment the wainscoting had closed behind them and the tapestry chamber was empty end of section five section six the canterville ghost a hilo idealistic romance chapter six about ten minutes later the bell rang for tea and as virginia did not come down mrs otis sent up one of the footmen to tell her after a little time he returned and said that he could not find miss virginia anywhere as she was in the habit of going out to the garden every evening to get flowers for the dinner table mrs otis was not at all alarmed at first but when six o'clock struck and virginia did not appear she became really agitated and sent the boys out to look for her while she herself and mr otis searched every room in the house at half past six the boys came back and said that they could find no trace of their sister anywhere they were all now in the greatest state of excitement and did not know what to do when mr otis suddenly remembered that some few days before he had given a band of gypsies permission to camp in the park he accordingly at once set off for blackfell hollow where he knew they were accompanied by his eldest son and two of the farm servants the little duke of cheshire who was perfectly frantic with anxiety begged hard to be allowed to go too but mr otis would not allow him as he was afraid there might be a scuffle on arriving at the spot however he found that the gypsies had gone and it was evident that their departure had been rather sudden as the fire was still burning and some plates were lying on the grass having sent off washington and two men to scour the district he ran home and dispatched telegrams to all the police inspectors in the county telling them to look out for a little girl who had been kidnapped by tramps or gypsies he then ordered his horse to be brought round and after insisting on his wife and the three boys sitting down to dinner rode off down the ascot road with a groom he had hardly however gone a couple of miles when he heard somebody galloping after him and looking round saw the little duke coming up on his pony with his face very flushed and no hat i'm awfully sorry mr otis gasped out the boy but i can't eat any dinner as long as virginia is lost please don't be angry with me if you had let us be engaged last year there would never have been all this trouble you won't send me back will you i can't go i won't go the minister could not help smiling at the handsome young scapegrace and was a good deal touched at his devotion to virginia so leaning down from his horse he patted him kindly on the shoulders and said well cecil if you won't go back i suppose you must come with me but i must get you a hat at ascot oh bother my hat i want virginia cried the little duke laughing and they galloped on to the railway station there mr otis inquired of the station master if any one answering the description of virginia had been seen on the platform but could get no news of her the station master however wired up and down the line and assured him that a strict watch would be kept for her and after having bought a hat for the little duke from a linen draper who was just putting up his shutters mr otis rode off to bexley a village about four miles away which he was told was a well-known haunt of the gypsies as there was a large common next to it here they roused up the rural policeman but could get no information from him and after riding all over the common they turned their horses heads homewards and reached the chase about eleven o'clock dead tired and almost heartbroken they found washington and the twins waiting for them at the gatehouse with lanterns as the avenue was very dark not the slightest trace of virginia had been discovered the gypsies had been caught on brockley meadows but she was not with them and they had explained their sudden departure by saying that they had mistaken the date of chorton fair and had gone off in a hurry for fear they might be late indeed they had been quite distressed at hearing of virginia's disappearance as they were very grateful to mr otis for having allowed them to camp in his park and four of their number had stayed behind to help in the search the carp pond had been dragged and the whole chase thoroughly gone over but without any result it was evident that for that night at any rate virginia was lost to them and it was in a state of the deepest depression that mr otis and the boys walked up to the house the groom following behind with the two horses and the pony 
in the hall they found a group of frightened servants and lying on a sofa in the library was poor mrs otis almost out of her mind with terror and anxiety and having her forehead bathed with eau de cologne by the old housekeeper mr otis at once insisted on her having something to eat and ordered up supper for the whole party it was a melancholy meal as hardly any one spoke and even the twins were awestruck and subdued as they were very fond of their sister when they had finished mr otis in spite of the entreaties of the little duke ordered them all to bed saying that nothing more could be done that night and that he would telegraph in the morning to scotland yard for some detectives to be sent down immediately just as they were passing out of the dining room midnight began to boom from the clock tower and when the last stroke sounded they heard a crash and a sudden shrill cry a dreadful peal of thunder shook the house a strain of unearthly music floated through the air a panel at the top of the staircase flew back with a loud noise and out on the landing looking very pale and white with a little casket in her hand stepped virginia in a moment they had all rushed up to her mrs otis clasped her passionately in her arms the duke smothered her with violent kisses and the twins executed a wild war dance round the group good heavens child where have you been said mr otis rather angrily thinking that she had been playing some foolish trick on them cecil and i have been riding all over the country looking for you and your mother has been frightened to death you must never play these practical jokes any more except on the ghost except on the ghost shrieked the twins as they capered about my own darling thank god you are found you must never leave my side again murmured mrs otis as she kissed the trembling child and smoothed the tangled gold of her hair papa said virginia quietly i have been with the ghost he is dead and you must come and see him he had been very wicked but he was really sorry for all that he had done and he gave me this box of beautiful jewels before he died the whole family gazed at her in mute amazement but she was quite grave and serious and turning round she led them through the opening in the wainscoting down a narrow street corridor, Washington following with a lighted candle which he had caught up from the table. Finally they came to a great oak door studded with rusty nails. When Virginia touched it, it swung back on its heavy hinges, and they found themselves in a little low room with a vaulted ceiling and one tiny grated window. Embedded in the wall was a huge iron ring, and chained to it was a gaunt skeleton that was stretched out at full length on the stone floor and seemed to be trying to grasp with its long fleshless fingers an old-fashioned trencher and ewer that were placed just outside of its reach the jug had evidently been once filled with water as it was covered inside with a green mould there was nothing on the trencher but a pile of dust virginia knelt down beside the skeleton and folding her little hands together began to pray silently while the rest of the party looked on in wonder at the terrible tragedy whose secret was now disclosed to them hello suddenly exclaimed one of the twins who had been looking out of the window to try and discover in what wing of the house the room was situated hello the old withered almond tree has blossomed i can see the flowers quite plainly in the moonlight god has forgiven him said virginia gravely as she rose to her feet and a beautiful light seemed to illumine her face what an angel you are cried the young duke and he put his arm around her neck and kissed her chapter seven four days after these curious incidents a funeral started from canterville chase at about eleven o'clock at night the hearse was drawn by eight black horses each of which carried on its head a great tuft of nodding ostrich plumes, and the leaden coffin was covered by a rich purple pall, on which was embroidered in gold the Canterville coat of arms. By the side of the hearse and the coaches walked the servants with lighted torches, and the whole procession was wonderfully impressive. Lord Canterville was the chief mourner, having come up specially from Wales to attend the funeral and sat in the first carriage along with little virginia then came the united states minister and his wife then washington and the three boys and in the last carriage was mrs umney it was generally felt that as she had been frightened by the ghost for more than fifty years of her life 
she had a right to see the last of him. A deep grave had been dug in the corner of the churchyard just under the old yew tree, and the service was read in the most impressive manner by the Reverend Augustus Dampier. When the ceremony was over, the servants, according to an old custom observed in the Canterville family, extinguished their torches, and as the coffin was being lowered into the grave, Virginia stepped forward and laid on it a large cross made of white and pink almond blossoms. As she did so, the moon came out from behind a cloud and flooded with its silent silver the little churchyard, and from a distant copse a nightingale began to sing. She thought of the ghost's description of the Garden of Death. Her eyes became dim with tears, and she hardly spoke a word during the drive home. The next morning, before Lord Canterville went up to town, Mr. Otis had an interview with him on the subject of the jewels the ghost had given to Virginia. They were perfectly magnificent, especially a certain ruby necklace with old Venetian setting, which was really a superb specimen of sixteenth-century work, and their value was so great that Mr. Otis felt considerable scruples about allowing his daughter to accept them. "'My lord,' he said, "'I know that in this country Mortmain is held to apply to trinkets as well as to land, and it is quite clear to me that these jewels are, or should be, heirlooms in your family. I must beg you, accordingly, to take them to London with you, and to regard them simply as a portion of your property which has been restored to you under certain strange conditions. As for my daughter, she is merely a child, and has as yet, I am glad to say, but little interest in such appurtenances of idle luxury. I am also informed by Mrs. Otis, who, I may say, is no mean authority upon art, having had the privilege of spending several winters in Boston when she was a girl, that these gems are of great monetary worth, and if offered for sale would fetch a tall price. Under these circumstances, Lord Canterville, I feel sure that you will recognize how impossible it would be for me to allow them to remain in the possession of any member of my family. And, indeed, all such vain gods and toys, however suitable or necessary to the dignity of the British aristocracy, would be completely out of place among those who have been brought up in the severe and, I believe, immortal principles of Republican simplicity. Perhaps I should mention that Virginia is very anxious that you should allow her to retain the box as a memento of your unfortunate but misguided ancestor. As it is extremely old, and consequently a good deal out of repair, you may perhaps think fit to comply with a request. For my own part, I confess I am a good deal surprised to find a child of mine expressing sympathy with medievalism in any form, and can only account for it by the fact that Virginia was born in one of your London suburbs shortly after Mrs. Otis had returned from a trip to Athens. Lord Canterville listened very gravely to the worthy minister's speech, pulling his grey moustache now and then to hide an involuntary smile, and when Mr. Otis had ended, he shook him cordially by the hand and said, My dear sir, your charming little daughter rendered my lucky ancestor, Sir Simon, a very important service, and I and my family are much indebted to her for her marvellous courage and pluck. The jewels are clearly hers, and egad, I believe that if I were heartless enough to take them from her, the wicked old fellow would be out of his grave in a fortnight, leading me the devil of a life. As for their being heirlooms, nothing is an heirloom that is not so mentioned in a will or legal document, and the existence of these jewels has been quite unknown. I assure you I have no more claim on them than your butler, and when Miss Virginia grows up, I dare say she will be pleased to have pretty things to wear. Besides, you forget, Mr. Otis, that you took the furniture and the ghost at a valuation, and anything that belonged to the ghost passed at once into your possession, as whatever activity Sir Simon may have shown in the corridor at night. In point of law, he was really dead, and you acquired his property by purchase. Mr. Otis was a good deal distressed at Lord Canterville's refusal, and begged him to reconsider his decision, but the good-natured peer was quite firm and finally induced the minister to allow his daughter to retain the present the ghost had given her, and when, in the spring of 1890, the young Duchess of Cheshire was presented at the Queen's first drawing-room on the occasion of her marriage, her jewels were the universal theme of admiration, 
for virginia received the coronet which is the reward of all good little american girls and was married to her boy lover as soon as he came of age they were both so charming and they loved each other so much that every one was delighted at the match except the old marchioness of dumbleton who had tried to catch the duke for one of her seven unmarried daughters and had given no less than three expensive dinner parties for that purpose and strange to say mr otis himself mr otis was extremely fond of the young duke personally but theoretically he objected to titles and to use his own words was not without apprehension lest amid the enervating influences of a pleasure-loving aristocracy the true principles of republican simplicity should be forgotten his objections however were completely overruled and i believe that when he walked up the aisle of st george's hanover square with his daughter leaning on his arm there was not a prouder man in the whole length and breadth of england the duke and duchess after the honeymoon was over went down to canterville chase and on the day after their arrival they walked over in the afternoon to the lonely churchyard by the pine woods there had been a great deal of difficulty at first about the inscription on sir simon's tombstone but finally it had been decided to engrave on it simply the initials of the old gentleman's name and the verse from the library window the duchess had brought with her some lovely roses which she strewed upon the grave and after they had stood by it for some time they strolled into the ruined chancel of the old abbey there the duchess sat down on a fallen pillar while her husband lay at her feet smoking a cigarette and looking up at her beautiful eyes suddenly he threw his cigarette away took hold of her hand and said to her virginia a wife should have no secrets from her husband dear cecil i have no secrets from you yes you have he answered smiling you have never told me what happened to you when you were locked up with the ghost i have never told anyone cecil said virginia gravely i know that but you might tell me please don't ask me cecil i cannot tell you poor simon i owe him a great deal yes don't laugh cecil i really do he made me see what life is and what death signifies and why love is stronger than both the duke rose and kissed his wife lovingly you can have your secret as long as i have your heart he murmured you have always had that cecil and you will tell your children some day won't you virginia blushed end of section six the sphinx without a secret one afternoon i was sitting outside the cafe de la paix watching the splendour and shabbiness of parisian life and wondering over my vermouth and the strange panorama of pride and poverty that was passing before me when i heard someone call my name I turned round and saw Lord Murchison. We had not met since we had been at college together, nearly ten years before, so I was delighted to come across him again, and we shook hands warmly. At Oxford we had been great friends. I had liked him immensely. He was so handsome, so high-spirited, and so honourable. We used to say of him that he would be the best of fellows if he did not always speak the truth but i think we really admired him all the same for his frankness i found him a good deal changed he looked anxious and puzzled and seemed to be in doubt about something i felt it could not be modern scepticism for murchison was the stoutest of tories and believed in the pentachuk as firmly as he believed in the house of peers so i concluded that it was a woman and asked him if he was married yet i don't understand women well enough he answered my dear gerald i said women are meant to be loved not to be understood i cannot love where i cannot trust he replied i believe you have a mystery in your life gerald i exclaimed tell me about it let us go for a drive he answered it is too crowded here no not a yellow carriage any other colour there that green one will do and in a few moments we were trotting down the boulevard in the direction of the madeleine where shall we go to i said oh anywhere you like he answered to the restaurant in the bois we will dine there and you shall tell me all about yourself i want to hear about you first i said tell me your mystery 
he took from his pocket a little silver-clasped Morocco case, and handed it to me. I opened it. Inside there was the photograph of a woman. She was tall and slight, and strangely picturesque, with her large vague eyes and loosened hair. She looked like a clairvoyant, and was wrapped in rich furs. "'What do you think of that face?' he said. "'Is it truthful?' I examined it carefully. It seemed to me the face of someone who had a secret, but whether that secret was good or evil, I could not say. Its beauty was a beauty moulded out of many mysteries, the beauty, in fact, which is psychological, not plastic, and the faint smile that just played across the lips was far too subtle to be really sweet. Well, he cried impatiently, what do you say? She is the Joconde in sables, I answered. Let me know all about her. Not now, he said, after dinner, and began to talk of other things. When the waiter brought us our coffee and cigarettes, I reminded Gerald of his promise. He rose from his seat, and walked two or three times up and down the room, and, sinking into an armchair, told me the following story. One evening, he said, I was walking down Bond Street about five o'clock. There was a terrific crush of carriages, and the traffic was almost stopped. Close to the pavement was standing a little yellow brougham, which for some reason or other attracted my attention. As I passed by, there looked out from it the face I showed you this afternoon. It fascinated me immediately. All that night I kept thinking of it, and all the next day. I wandered up and down the wretched row, peering into every carriage, and waiting for the yellow brougham. But I could not find ma belle inconnue, and at last I began to think she was merely a dream. About a week afterwards, I was dining with Madame de Rastail. Dinner was for eight o'clock, but at half-past eight we were still waiting in the drawing-room. Finally the servant threw open the door, and announced Lady Alroy. It was the woman I had been looking for. She came in, very slowly, looking like a moonbeam in grey lace, and, to my intense delight, I was asked to take her in to dinner. After we had sat down, I remarked quite innocently, I think I caught sight of you in Bond Street some time ago, Lady Alroy. She grew very pale, and said to me in a low voice, Pray, do not talk so loud, you may be overheard. I felt miserable at having made such a bad beginning, and plunged recklessly into the subject of the French plays. She spoke very little, always in the same low musical voice, and seemed as if she was afraid of someone listening. I fell passionately, stupidly in love, and the indefinable atmosphere of mystery that surrounded her excited my most ardent curiosity. When she was going away, which she did very soon after dinner, I asked her if I might call and see her. She hesitated for a moment, glanced round to see if anyone was near us, and then said, Yes, tomorrow, at a quarter to five. I begged Madame de Rastail to tell me about her, but all that I could learn was that she was a widow with a beautiful house in Park Lane, and as some scientific bore began a dissertation on widows, as exemplifying the survival of the matrimonially fittest, I left and went home. The next day I arrived in Park Lane, punctual to the moment, but was told by the butler that Lady Alroy had just gone out. I went down to the club quite unhappy, and very much puzzled, and after long consideration wrote her a letter asking if I might be allowed to try my chance some other afternoon. I had no answer for several days, but at last I got a little note saying she would be at home on Sunday, at four, and with this extraordinary postscript. Please do not write to me here again. I will explain when I see you. On Sunday she received me, and was perfectly charming, but when I was going away she begged of me, if ever I had occasion to write to her again, to address my letter to Mrs. Knox, Care of Whittaker's Library, Green Street. There are reasons, she said, why I cannot receive letters in my own house. All through the season I saw a great deal of her, and the atmosphere of mystery never left her. Sometimes I thought that she was in the power of some man, but she looked so unapproachable that I could not believe it. It was really very difficult for me to come to any conclusion, for she was like one of those strange crystals that one sees in museums, which are at one moment clear, and at another clouded. 
At last I determined to ask her to be my wife. I was sick and tired of the incessant secrecy that she imposed on all my visits, and on a few letters I sent her. I wrote to her at the library to ask her if she could see me the following Monday at six. She answered yes, and I was in a seventh heaven of delight. I was infatuated with her, in spite of the mystery. I thought then, in consequence of it. I see now. No, it was the woman herself I loved. The mystery troubled me, maddened me. Why did chance put me in its track? You discovered it, then? I cried. I fear so, he answered. You can judge for yourself. When Monday came round, I went to lunch with my uncle, and about four o'clock found myself in the Marylebone Road. My uncle, you know, lives in Regent's Park. I wanted to get to Piccadilly, and took a shortcut through a lot of shabby little streets. Suddenly I saw in front of me Lady Alroy, deeply veiled and walking very fast. On coming to the last house in the street, she went up the steps, took out the latch-key, and let herself in. Here is the mystery, I said to myself, and I hurried on and examined the house. It seemed a sort of place for letting lodgings. On the doorstep lay her handkerchief, which she had dropped. I picked it up and put it in my pocket. Then I began to consider what I should do. I came to the conclusion that I had no right to spy on her, and I drove down to the club. At six I called to see her. She was lying on a sofa, in a tea-gown of silver tissue looped up by some strange moonstones that she always wore. She was looking quite lovely. I am so glad to see you, she said. I have not been out all day. I stared at her in amazement, and pulling the handkerchief out of my pocket, handed it to her. You dropped this in Cumnor Street this afternoon, Lady Alroy, I said very calmly. She looked at me in terror, but made no attempt to take the handkerchief. What were you doing there? I asked. What right have you to question me? She answered. The right of a man who loves you, I replied. I came here to ask you to be my wife. She hid her face in her hands, and burst into floods of tears. You must tell me, I continued. She stood up, and looking me straight in the face, said, Lord Murchison, there is nothing to tell you. You went to meet someone, I cried. This is your mystery. She grew dreadfully white and said, I went to meet no one. Can't you tell the truth, I exclaimed. I have told it, she replied. I was mad, frantic. I don't know what I said, but I said terrible things to her. Finally, I rushed out of the house. She wrote me a letter the next day. I sent it back unopened, and, and started for Norway with Alan Colville. After a month, I came back, and the first thing I saw in the morning post was the death of Lady Alroy. She had caught a chill at the opera, and had died in five days of congestion of the lungs. I shut myself up, and saw no one. I had loved her so much. I had loved her so madly. Good God, how I loved that woman! You went to the street? To the house in it? I said. Yes, he answered. One day I went to Cumnor Street. I could not help it. I was tortured with doubt. I knocked at the door, and a respectable-looking woman opened it to me. I asked her if she had any rooms to let. Well, sir, she replied, the drawing-rooms are supposed to be let, but I have not seen the lady for three months, and as rent is owing on them, you can have them. Is this the lady? I said, showing her the photograph. That's her, sure enough, she exclaimed. And when is she coming back, sir? The lady is dead, I replied. Oh, sir, I hope not, said the woman. She was my best lodger. She paid me three guineas a week merely to sit in my drawing-room now and then. She met someone here, I said, but the woman assured me that it was not so, that she always came alone and saw no one. What on earth did she do here? I cried. She simply sat in the drawing-room, sir, reading books, and sometimes had tea. The woman answered. I did not know what to say, so I gave her a sovereign and went away. Now, what do you think it all meant? You don't believe the woman was telling the truth? I do. 
"'Then why did Lady Alroy go there?' "'My dear Gerald,' I answered, "'Lady Alroy was simply a woman with a mania for mystery. "'She took these rooms for the pleasure of going there with her veil down, "'and imagining she was a heroine. "'She had a passion for secrecy, "'but she herself was merely a sphinx without a secret. "'Do you really think so?' "'I am sure of it,' I replied. "'He took out the Morocco case.' opened it, and looked at the photograph. "'I wonder,' he said at last. End of Section 7 The Sphinx Without a Secret The Model Millionaire Unless one is wealthy, there is no use in being a charming fellow. Romance is the privilege of the rich, not the profession of the unemployed. The poor should be practical and prosaic. It is better to have a permanent income than to be fascinating. These are the great truths of modern life which Huey Erskine never realised. Poor Huey! Intellectually, we must admit, he was not of much importance. He never said a brilliant or even an ill-natured thing in his life. But then, he was wonderfully good-looking, with his crisp brown hair, his clear-cut profile, and his grey eyes. He was as popular with men as he was with women, and he had every accomplishment except that of making money. His father had bequeathed him his cavalry sword and the history of the Peninsular War, in fifteen volumes. Huey hung the first over his looking-glass, put the second on a shelf between Ruff's Guide and Bailey's Magazine, and lived on two hundred a year that an old aunt allowed him. He had tried everything. He had gone on a stock exchange for six months, but what was a butterfly to do among bulls and bears? He had been a tea merchant for a little longer, but had soon tired of Pico and Souchong. Then he had tried selling dry sherry. That did not answer. The sherry was a little too dry. Ultimately he became nothing, a delightful, ineffectual young man, with a perfect profile and no profession. To make matters worse, he was in love. The girl he loved was Laura Merton, the daughter of a retired colonel, who had lost his temper and his digestion in India, and had never found either of them again. Laura adored him, and he was ready to kiss her shoestrings. They were the handsomest couple in London, and had not a penny piece between them. The Colonel was very fond of Huey, but would not hear of any engagement. Come to me, boy, when you have got ten thousand pounds of your own, and we will see about it, he used to say and Huey looked very glum in those days, and had to go to Laura for consolation. One morning, as he was on his way to Holland Park, where the Mertons lived, he dropped in to see a great friend of his, Alan Trevor. Trevor was a painter. Indeed, few people escape that nowadays. But he was also an artist, and artists are rather rare. Personally, he was a strange, rough fellow, with a freckled face and a red, ragged beard, However, when he took up the brush he was a real master, and his pictures were eagerly sought after. He had been very much attracted by Huey at first, it must be acknowledged, entirely on account of his personal charm. The only people a painter should know, he used to say, are people who are bet and beautiful. People who are an artistic pleasure to look at, and an intellectual repose to talk to. Men who are dandies and women who are darlings rule the world. At least, they should do so. However, after he got to know Huey better, he liked him quite as much for his bright, buoyant spirits and his generous, reckless nature, and had given him the permanent entree to his studio. When Huey came in, he found Trevor putting the finishing touches to a wonderful life-size picture of a beggar man. The beggar himself was standing on a raised platform in a corner of the studio. He was a wizened old man, with a face like wrinkled parchment, and a most piteous expression. Over his shoulders was flung a coarse brown cloak, all tears and tatters. His thick boots were patched and cobbled, and with one hand he leant on a rough stick, while with the other he held out his battered hat for alms. "'What an amazing model!' whispered Huey, as he shook hands with his friend. "'An amazing model!' 
shouted Trevor, at the top of his voice. I should think so. Such beggars as he are not to be met with every day. A trouvaille mon cher, a living Velasquez. My stars, what an etching Rembrandt would have made of him. Poor old chap, said Huey. How miserable he looks, but I suppose, to you painters, his face is his fortune? Certainly, replied Trevor. You don't want a beggar to look happy, do you? How much does a model get for sitting? asked Huey, as he found himself a comfortable seat on a divan. A shilling an hour. And how much do you get for your picture, Alan? Oh, for this I get two thousand. Pounds? Guineas. Painters, poets and physicians always get guineas. Well, I think the model should have a percentage, cried Huey, laughing. They work quite as hard as you do. Nonsense, nonsense. Why, look at the trouble of having to lay on the paint alone, and standing all day long at one's easel. It's all very well, Huey, for you to talk, but I assure you, there are moments when art almost attains to the dignity of manual labour. But you mustn't chatter. I'm very busy. Smoke a cigarette and keep quiet. After some time, the servant came in, and told Trevor that the frame-maker wanted to speak to him. "'Don't run away, Huey,' he said as he went out. "'I will be back in a moment.' The old beggar-man took advantage of Trevor's absence to rest for a moment on a wooden bench that was behind him. He looked so forlorn and wretched that Huey could not help pitying him, and felt in his pockets to see what money he had. All he could find was a sovereign and some coppers. Poor old fellow, he thought to himself. He wants it more than I do, but it means no handsomes for a fortnight. And he walked across the studio and slipped the sovereign into the beggar's hand. The old man started, and a faint smile flitted across his withered lips. Thank you, sir, he said. Thank you. Then Trevor arrived, and Huey took his leave blushing a little at what he had done. He spent the day with Laura, got a charming scolding for his extravagance, and had to walk home. That night he strolled into the pallet club about eleven o'clock, and found Trevor sitting by himself in the smoking room, drinking hock and seltzer. "'Well, Alan, did you get the picture finished all right?' he said as he lit his cigarette. "'Finished and framed, my boy,' answered Trevor. "'And by the by, you have made a conquest. That old model you saw is quite devoted to you. I had to tell him all about you. Who you are, where you live, what your income is, what prospects you have. My dear Alan, cried Huey, I shall probably find him waiting for me when I go home. But of course you are only joking. Poor old wretch. I wish I could do something for him. I think it is dreadful that anyone should be so miserable. I have got heaps of old clothes at home. Do you think he would care for any of them? Why, his rags were falling to bits. But he looks splendid in them, said Trevor. I wouldn't paint him in a frock coat for anything. What you call rags, I call romance. What seems poverty to you is picturesqueness to me. However, I'll tell him of your offer. Alan, said Huey seriously, you painters are a heartless lot. An artist's heart is his head, replied Trevor, and besides, our business is to realise the world as we see it, not to reform it as we know it. A chacun son métier. And now, tell me how Laura is. The old model was quite interested in her. You don't mean to say you talked to him about her, said Huey. Certainly I did. He knows all about the relentless colonel, the lovely Laura, and the ten thousand. "'You told that beggar my private affairs?' cried Huey, looking very red and angry. "'My dear boy,' said Trevor, smiling, "'that old beggar, as you call him, is one of the richest men in Europe. He could buy all London tomorrow without overdrawing his account. He has a house in every capital, dines off gold plate, and can prevent Russia going to war when he chooses.' "'What on earth do you mean?' exclaimed Huey. 
"'What I say,' said Trevor. "'The old man you saw today in the studio was Baron Hausberg. "'He is a great friend of mine, buys all my pictures and that sort of thing, "'and gave me a commission a month ago to paint him as a beggar. "'Que voulez-vous? La fantaisie d'un millionnaire. "'And I must say, he made a magnificent figure in his rags. "'Or perhaps I should say, in my rags. "'They are an old suit I got in Spain.' "'Baron Hausberg, cried Huey. "'Good heavens! I gave him a sovereign!' "'And he sank into an armchair, the picture of dismay. "'Gave him a sovereign?' shouted Trevor, "'and he burst into a roar of laughter. "'My dear boy, you'll never see it again. "'Son affaire, c'est l'argent des autres.' "'I think you might have told me, Alan,' said Huey sulkily, and not have let me make such a fool of myself. "'Well, to begin with, Huey,' said Trevor, "'it never entered my mind that you went about distributing alms in that reckless way. I can understand your kissing a pretty model, but you're giving a sovereign to an ugly one. By Jove, no! Besides, the fact is that I really was not at home today to anyone, and when you came in, I didn't know whether Hausberg would like his name mentioned. You know he wasn't in full dress.' "'What a duffer he must think me,' said Huey. "'Not at all. He was in the highest spirits after you left, kept chuckling to himself and rubbing his old wrinkled hands together. I couldn't make out why he was so interested to know all about you. But I see it all now. He'll invest your sovereign for you, Huey, pay you the interest every six months, and have a capital story to tell after dinner.' "'I am an unlucky devil,' growled Huey. The best thing I can do is to go to bed. And, my dear Alan, you mustn't tell anyone. I shouldn't dare show my face in a row. Nonsense! It reflects the highest credit in your philanthropic spirit, Huey. And don't run away. Have another cigarette, and you can talk about Laura as much as you like. However, Huey wouldn't stop, but walked home, feeling very unhappy, and leaving Alan Trevor in fits of laughter. The next morning, as he was at breakfast, the servant brought him up a card on which was written, Monsieur Gustave Naudin, de la part de Monsieur le Baron Hausberg. I suppose he has come for an apology, said Huey to himself, and he told the servant to show the visitor up. An old gentleman, with gold spectacles and grey hair, came into the room, and said, in a slight French accent, Have I the honour of addressing Monsieur Erskine? Huey bowed. I have come from Baron Hausberg, he continued. The Baron... I beg, sir, that you will offer him my sincerest apologies, stammered Huey. The Baron, said the old gentleman with a smile, has commissioned me to bring you this letter, and he extended a sealed envelope. On the outside was written, A wedding present to Hugh Erskine and Laura Merton from an old beggar, and inside was a cheque for ten thousand pounds. When they were married, Alan Trevor was the best man, and the Baron made a speech at the wedding breakfast. "'Millionaire models,' remarked Alan, "'are rare enough, but by Jove, model millionaires are rarer still!' End of Section 8 The Model Millionaire Section 9 The Portrait of Mr. W. H. Chapter 1 I had been dining with Erskine in his pretty little house in Birdcage Walk, and we were sitting in the library over our coffee and cigarettes when the question of literary forgeries happened to turn up in conversation. I cannot at present remember how it was that we struck upon this somewhat curious topic, as it was at that time, but I know that we had a long discussion about Macpherson, Ireland, and Chatterton, and that, with regard to the last, I insisted that his so-called forgeries were merely the result of an artistic desire for perfect representation, that we had no right to quarrel with an artist for the conditions under which he chooses to present his work, and that all art being to a certain degree a mode of acting, an attempt to realize one's own personality on some imaginative plane out of reach of the trammeling accidents and limitations of real life, to censure an artist for a forgery, was to confuse an ethical with an aesthetical problem. 
Erskine, who was a good deal older than I was, and had been listening to me with the amused deference of a man of forty, suddenly put his hand upon my shoulder and said to me, "'What would you say about a young man who had a strange theory about a certain work of art, believed in his theory, and committed a forgery in order to prove it?' "'Ah, that is quite a different matter,' I answered." Erskine remained silent for a few moments, looking at the thin grey threads of smoke that were rising from his cigarette. "'Yes,' he said, after a pause, "'quite different.' There was something in the tone of his voice, a slight touch of bitterness, perhaps, that excited my curiosity. "'Did you ever know anybody who did that?' I cried. "'Yes,' he answered, throwing his cigarette into the fire. A great friend of mine, Cyril Graham. He was very fascinating and very foolish and very heartless. However, he left me the only legacy I ever received in my life. Uh, what was that? I exclaimed. Erskine rose from his seat, and going over to a tall inlaid cabinet that stood between the two windows, unlocked it and came back to where I was sitting, holding in his hand a small panel picture set in an old and somewhat tarnished Elizabethan frame. It was a full-length portrait of a young man in late sixteenth-century costume, standing by a table with his right hand resting on an open book. He seemed about seventeen years of age, and was of quite extraordinary personal beauty, though evidently somewhat effeminate. Indeed, had it not been for the dress and the closely cropped hair, one would have said that the face, with its dreamy, wistful eyes and its delicate scarlet lips, was the face of a girl. In manner, and especially in the treatment of the hands, the picture reminded one of Francois Clouet's later work. The black velvet doublet with its fantastically gilded points, and the peacock blue background against which it showed up so pleasantly, and from which it gained such luminous value of color, were quite in Clouet's style. And the two masks of tragedy and comedy that hung somewhat formally from the marble pedestal, had that hard severity of touch, so different from the facile grace of the Italians, which, even at the court of France, the great Flemish master never completely lost, and which in itself has always been a characteristic of the northern temper. "'It is a charming thing,' I cried. "'But who is this wonderful young man, whose beauty art has so happily preserved for us?' "'This is the portrait of Mr. W. H.' said Erskine, with a sad smile. "'It might have been a chance effect of light, "'but it seemed to me that his eyes were quite bright with tears. "'Mr. W. H.' I exclaimed. "'Who was Mr. W. H.?' "'Don't you remember?' he answered. "'Look at the book on which his hand is resting.' "'I see there is some writing there, but I cannot make it out,' I replied." "'Take this magnifying glass and try,' said Erskine, with the same sad smile still playing about his mouth. I took the glass, and moving the lamp a little nearer, I began to spell out the crabbed sixteenth-century handwriting. To the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets. "'Good heavens!' I cried. "'Is this Shakespeare's, Mr. W. H.?' "'Cyril Graham used to say so,' muttered Erskine. "'But it is not a bit like Lord Pembroke,' I answered. "'I know the Penshurst portraits very well. "'I was staying near there a few weeks ago.' "'Do you really believe, then, "'that the sonnets are addressed to Lord Pembroke?' he asked. "'I am sure of it,' I answered. "'Pembroke, Shakespeare, and Mrs. Mary Fighton "'are the three personages of the sonnets. "'There is no doubt at all about it.' "'Well, I agree with you,' said Erskine but I did not always think so. I used to believe, well, I suppose I used to believe in Cyril Graham and his theory. And what was that? I asked, looking at the wonderful portrait, which had already begun to have a strange fascination for me. It's a long story, said Erskine, taking the picture away from me, rather abruptly, I thought, at the time. A very long story. But if you care to hear it, I will tell it to you. "'I love theories about the sonnets,' I cried. "'But I don't think I am likely to be converted to any new idea. "'The matter has ceased to be a mystery to anyone. "'Indeed, I wonder that it ever was a mystery.' 
"'As I don't believe in the theory, I am not likely to convert you to it,' said Erskine, laughing. "'But it may interest you.' "'Tell it to me, of course,' I answered. "'If it is half as delightful as the picture, I shall be more than satisfied.' "'Well,' said Erskine, lighting a cigarette, "'I must begin by telling you about Cyril Graham himself. "'He and I were at the same house at Eton.' I was a year or two older than he was, but we were immense friends, and did all our work and all our play together. There was, of course, a good deal more play than work, but I cannot say that I am sorry for that. It is always an advantage not to have received a sound commercial education, and what I learned in the playing fields at Eton has been quite as useful to me as anything I was taught at Cambridge. I should tell you that Cyril's father and mother were both dead. They had been drowned in a horrible yachting accident off the Isle of Wight. His father had been in the diplomatic service, and had married a daughter, the only daughter, in fact, of old Lord Crediton, who became Cyril's guardian after the death of his parents. I don't think that Lord Crediton cared very much for Cyril. He had never really forgiven his daughter for marrying a man who had not a title. He was an extraordinary old aristocrat, who swore like a costermonger and had the manners of a farmer. I remember seeing him once on speech day. He growled at me, gave me a sovereign, and told me not to grow up a damned radical like my father. Cyril had very little affection for him, and was only too glad to spend most of his holidays with us in Scotland. They never really got on together at all. Cyril thought him a bear, and he thought Cyril effeminate. He was effeminate, I suppose, in some things, though he was a very good writer and a capital fencer. In fact, he got the foils before he left Eton. But he was very languid in his manner, and not a little vain of his good looks, and had a strong objection to football. The two things that really gave him pleasure were poetry and acting. At Eton, he was always dressing up and reciting Shakespeare and when we went up to Trinity he became a member of the ADC his first term. I remember I was always very jealous of his acting. I was absurdly devoted to him, I suppose because we were so different in some things. I was a rather awkward, weakly lad, with huge feet, and horribly freckled. Freckles run in Scotch families just as gout does in English families. Cyril used to say that of the two he preferred the gout, but he always set an absurdly high value on personal appearance, and once read a paper before our debating society to prove that it was better to be good-looking than to be good. He certainly was wonderfully handsome. People who did not like him, Philistines and college tutors and young men reading for the church, used to say that he was merely pretty, but there was a great deal more in his face than mere prettiness. I think he was the most splendid creature I ever saw and nothing could exceed the grace of his movements, the charm of his manner. He fascinated everybody who was worth fascinating, and a great many people who were not. He was often willful and petulant, and I used to think him dreadfully insincere. It was due, I think, chiefly to his inordinate desire to please. Poor Cyril! I told him once that he was contented with very cheap triumphs, but he only laughed. He was horribly spoiled. All charming people, I fancy, are spoiled. It is the secret of their attraction. However, I must tell you about Cyril's acting. You know that no actresses are allowed to play at the ADC. At least they were not in my time. I don't know how it is now. Well, of course, Cyril was always cast for the girls' parts, and when As You Like It was produced, he played Rosalind. It was a marvelous performance. In fact, Cyril Graham was the only perfect Rosalind I have ever seen. It would be impossible to describe to you the beauty, the delicacy, the refinement of the whole thing. It made an immense sensation, and the horrid little theater, as it was then, was crowded every night. Even when I read the play now, I can't help thinking of Cyril. It might have been written for him. The next term he took his degree and came to London to read for the diplomatic, but he never did any work. He spent his days in reading Shakespeare's sonnets and his evenings at the theatre. 
he was of course wild to go on the stage it was all that i and lord crediton could do to prevent him perhaps if he had gone on the stage he would be alive now it is always a silly thing to give advice but to give good advice is absolutely fatal i hope you will never fall into that error if you do you will be sorry for it well to come to the real point of the story one day i got a letter from cyril asking me to come round to his rooms that evening he had charming chambers in piccadilly overlooking the green park and as i used to go to see him every day i was rather surprised at his taking the trouble to write of course i went and when i arrived i found him in a state of great excitement he told me that he had at last discovered the true secret of shakespeare's sonnets that all the scholars and critics had been entirely on the wrong tack and that he was the first who working purely by internal evidence had found out who mr w h really was he was perfectly wild with delight and for a long time would not tell me his theory finally he produced a bundle of notes took his copy of the sonnets off the mantelpiece and sat down and gave me a long lecture on the whole subject he began by pointing out that the young man to whom shakespeare addressed these strangely passionate poems must have been somebody who was a really vital factor in the development of his dramatic art and that this could not be said either of lord pembroke or lord southampton indeed whoever he was he could not have been anybody of high birth as was shown very clearly by the twenty-fifth sonnet in which shakespeare contrasting himself with those who are great princes favorites says quite frankly let those who are in favor with their stars of public honor and proud titles boast whilst i whom fortune of such triumph bars unlooked for joy in that i honor most and ends the sonnet by congratulating himself on the mean state of him he so adored then happy i that love and am beloved where i may not remove nor be removed this sonnet cyril declared would be quite unintelligible if we fancied that it was addressed to either the earl of pembroke or the earl of southampton both of whom were men of the highest position in england and fully entitled to be called great princes and he in corroboration of his view read me sonnets one hundred twenty four and one hundred twenty five in which shakespeare tells us that his love is not the child of state that it suffers not in smiling pomp but is builded far from accident i listened with a good deal of interest for i don't think the point had ever been made before but what followed was still more curious and seemed to me at the time to dispose entirely of pembroke's claim we know from mears that the sonnets had been written before fifteen ninety eight and sonnet one hundred four informs us that shakespeare's friendship with mr w h had been already in existence for three years now lord pembroke who was born in fifteen eighty did not come to london till he was eighteen years of age that is to say till fifteen ninety eight and shakespeare's acquaintance with mr w h must have begun in fifteen ninety four or at the latest in fifteen ninety five shakespeare accordingly could not have known lord pembroke till after the sonnets had been written cyril pointed out also that pembroke's father did not die till sixteen o one whereas it was evident from the line you had a father let your son say so that the father of mr w h was dead in fifteen ninety eight besides it was absurd to imagine that any publisher of the time and the preface is from the publisher's hand would have ventured to address william herbert earl of pembroke as mr w h the case of lord buckhurst being spoken of as mr sackville being not really a parallel instance as lord buckhurst was not a peer but merely the younger son of a peer with a courtesy title and the passage in england's parnassus where he is so spoken of is not a formal and stately dedication but simply a casual allusion so far for lord pembroke whose supposed claims cyril easily demolished while i sat by in wonder with lord southampton cyril had even less difficulty southampton became at a very early age the lover of elizabeth vernon so he needed no entreaties to marry he was not beautiful he did not resemble his mother as mr w h did thou art thy mother's glass 
and she in thee calls back the lovely april of her prime and above all his christian name was henry whereas the punning sonnets one hundred thirty five and one hundred forty three show that the christian name of shakespeare's friend was the same as his own will as for the other suggestions of unfortunate commentators that mr w h is a misprint for mr w s meaning mr william shakespeare that mr w h all should be read mr w hall that mr w h is mr william hathaway and that a full stop should be placed after wisheth making mr w h the writer and not the subject of the dedication cyril got rid of them in a very short time and it is not worth while to mention his reasons though i remember he sent me off into a fit of laughter by reading to me i am glad to say not in the original some extracts from a german commentator called barnstorff who insisted that mr w h was no less a person than mr william himself nor would he allow for a moment that the sonnets are mere satires on the work of Dryden and john davies of hereford to him as indeed to me they were poems of serious and tragic import wrung out of the bitterness of shakespeare's heart and made sweet by the honey of his lips still less would he admit that they were merely a philosophical allegory and that in them shakespeare is addressing his ideal self or ideal manhood or the spirit of beauty or the reason or the divine logos or the catholic church he felt as indeed i think we all must feel that the sonnets are addressed to an individual to a particular young man whose personality for some reason seems to have filled the soul of shakespeare with terrible joy and no less terrible despair having in this manner cleared the way as it were cyril asked me to dismiss from my mind any preconceived ideas i might have formed on the subject and to give a fair and unbiased hearing to his own theory the problem he pointed out was this who was that young man of shakespeare's day who without being of noble birth or even of noble nature was addressed by him in terms of such passionate adoration that we can but wonder at the strange worship and are almost afraid to turn the key that unlocks the mystery of the poet's heart who was he whose physical beauty was such that it became the very cornerstone of shakespeare's art the very source of shakespeare's inspiration the very incarnation of shakespeare's dreams to look upon him as simply the object of certain love poems is to miss the whole meaning of the poems for the art of which shakespeare talks in the sonnets is not the art of the sonnets themselves which indeed were to him but slight and secret things it is the art of the dramatist to which he is always alluding and he to whom shakespeare said thou art all my art and dost advance as high as learning my rude ignorance he to whom he promised immortality where breath most breathes even in the mouths of men was surely none other than the boy actor for whom he created viola and imogene juliet and rosalind portia and desdemona and cleopatra herself this was cyril graham's theory evolved as you see purely from the sonnets themselves and depending for its acceptance not so much on demonstrable proof or formal evidence but on a kind of spiritual and artistic sense by which alone he claimed could the true meaning of the poems be discerned i remember his reading to me that fine sonnet how can my muse want subject to invent whilst thou dost breathe that pourest into my verse thine own sweet argument too excellent for every vulgar paper to rehearse o oh, give thyself the thanks if aught in me worthy perusal stand against thy sight for who so dumb that cannot write to thee when thou thyself dost give invention light be thou the tenth muse ten times more in worth than those old nine which rhymers invocate and he that calls on thee let him bring forth eternal numbers to outlive long date and pointing out how completely it corroborated his theory and indeed he went through all the sonnets carefully and showed or fancied that he showed that according to his new explanation of their meaning things that had seemed obscure or evil or exaggerated became clear and rational and of high artistic import illustrating shakespeare's conception of the true relations between the art of the actor 
and the art of the dramatist. It is, of course, evident that there must have been in Shakespeare's company some wonderful boy actor of great beauty, to whom he entrusted the presentation of his noble heroines, for Shakespeare was a practical theatre manager, as well as an imaginative poet, and Cyril Graham had actually discovered the boy actor's name. He was Will, or, as he preferred to call him, Willie Hughes. The Christian name he found, of course, in the punning sonnets, 135 and 143. The surname was, according to him, hidden in the seventh line of the twentieth sonnet, where Mr. W. H. is described as, A man in hue, all hues in his controlling. In the original edition of the sonnets, Hughes is printed with a capital letter and in italics, and this, he claimed, showed clearly that a play on words was intended, his view receiving a good deal of corroboration from those sonnets in which curious puns are made on the words use and usury. Of course I was converted at once, and Willie Hughes became to me as real a person as Shakespeare. The only objection I made to the theory was that the name of Willie Hughes does not occur in the list of the actors of Shakespeare's company as it is printed in the first folio. Cyril, however, pointed out that the absence of Willie Hughes's name from this list really corroborated the theory, as it was evident from Sonnet 86, that Willie Hughes had abandoned Shakespeare's company to play at a rival theatre, probably in some of Chapman's plays. It is in reference to this that in the great sonnet on Chapman, Shakespeare said to Willie Hughes, But when your countenance filled up his line, then lacked I matter that enfeebled mine. The expression, when your countenance filled up his line, referring obviously to the beauty of the young actor giving life and reality, and added charm to Chapman's verse, the same idea being also put forward in the seventy-ninth sonnet. Whilst I alone did call upon thy aid, my verse alone had all thy gentle grace. But now my gracious numbers are decayed, and my sick muse doth give another place. And in the immediately preceding sonnet, where Shakespeare says, Every alien pen has got my use, and under thee their poesy disperse. The play upon words, use equals hues, being of course obvious, and the phrase under thee their poesy disperse, meaning by your assistance as an actor bring their plays before the people. It was a wonderful evening, and we sat up almost till dawn, reading and re-reading the sonnets. After some time, however, I began to see that before the theory could be placed before the world in a really perfected form, it was necessary to get some independent evidence about the existence of this young actor, Willie Hughes. If this could be once established, there could be no possible doubt about his identity with Mr. W. H. But otherwise, the theory would fall to the ground. I put this forward very strongly to Cyril, who was a good deal annoyed at what he called my Philistine tone of mind, and indeed was rather bitter upon the subject. However, I made him promise that in his own interest he would not publish his discovery till he had put the whole matter beyond the reach of doubt. And for weeks and weeks we searched the registers of city churches, the Allen MSS at Dulwich, the record office, the papers of the Lord Chamberlain, everything, in fact, that we thought might contain some allusion to Willie Hughes. We discovered nothing, of course, and every day the existence of Willie Hughes seemed to me to become more problematical. Cyril was in a dreadful state, and used to go over the whole question day after day, entreating me to believe. But I saw the one flaw in the theory, and I refused to be convinced till the actual existence of Willie Hughes, a boy actor of Elizabethan days, had been placed beyond the reach of doubt or cavil. One day Cyril left town to stay with his grandfather, I thought at the time, but I afterwards heard from Lord Crediton that this was not the case, and about a fortnight afterwards I received a telegram from him, handed in at Warwick, asking me to be sure to come and dine with him that evening at eight o'clock. When I arrived, he said to me, the only apostle who did not deserve proof was St. Thomas, and St. Thomas was the only apostle who got it. I asked him what he meant. He answered that he had not merely been able to establish the existence in the sixteenth century of a boy actor of the name of Willie Hughes, but to prove by the most conclusive evidence that he was the Mr. W. H. of the sonnets. 
he would not tell me anything more at the time but after dinner he solemnly produced the picture i showed you and told me that he had discovered it by the merest chance nailed to the side of an old chest that he had bought at a farmhouse in warwickshire the chest itself which was a very fine example of elizabethan work he had of course brought with him and in the center of the front panel the initials w h were undoubtedly carved it was this monogram that had attracted his attention and he told me that it was not till he had had the chest in his possession for several days that he had thought of making any careful examination of the inside one morning however he saw that one of the sides of the chest was much thicker than the other and looking more closely he discovered that a framed panel picture was clamped against it on taking it out he found it was the picture that is now lying on the sofa it was very dirty and covered with mould but he managed to clean it and to his great joy saw that he had fallen by mere chance on the one thing for which he had been looking here was an authentic portrait of mr w h with his hand resting on the dedicatory page of the sonnets and on the frame itself could be faintly seen the name of the young man written in black unshiel letters on a faded gold ground master will hughes well what was i to say it never occurred to me for a moment that cyril graham was playing a trick on me or that he was trying to prove his theory by means of a forgery but is it a forgery i asked of course it is said erskine it is a very good forgery but it is a forgery none the less i thought at the time that cyril was rather calm about the whole matter but i remember he more than once told me that he himself required no proof of the kind and that he thought the theory complete without it i laughed at him and told him that without it the theory would fall to the ground and i warmly congratulated him on the marvellous discovery we then arranged that the picture should be etched or facsimiled and placed as the frontispiece to cyril's edition of the sonnets and for three months we did nothing but go over each poem line by line till we had settled every difficulty of text or meaning one unlucky day i was in a print shop in holborn when i saw upon the counter some extremely beautiful drawings in silver point i was so attracted by them that i bought them and the proprietor of the place a man called rawlings told me that they were done by a young painter of the name of edward merton who was very clever but as poor as a church mouse i went to see merton some days afterwards having got his address from the print seller and found a pale interesting young man with a rather common-looking wife his model as i subsequently learned i told him how much i admired his drawings at which he seemed very pleased and i asked him if he would show me some of his other work as we were looking over a portfolio full of really very lovely things for merton had a most delicate and delightful touch i suddenly caught sight of a drawing of the picture of mr w h there was no doubt whatever about it it was almost a facsimile the only difference being that the two masks of tragedy and comedy were not suspended from the marble table as they are in the picture but were lying on the floor at the young man's feet where on earth did you get that i said he grew rather confused and said oh that is nothing i did not know it was in this portfolio it is not a thing of any value it is what you did for mr cyril graham exclaimed his wife and if this gentleman wishes to buy it let him have it for mr cyril graham i repeated did you paint the picture of mr w h i don't understand what you mean he answered growing very red well the whole thing was quite dreadful the wife let it all out i gave her five pounds when i was going away i can't bear to think of it now but of course i was furious i went off at once to cyril's chambers waited there for three hours before he came in with that horrid lie staring me in the face and told him i had discovered his forgery he grew very pale and said i did it purely for your sake you would not be convinced in any other way it does not affect the truth of the theory the truth of the theory i exclaimed the less we talk about that the better you never even believed in it yourself if you had you would not have committed a forgery to prove it high words passed between us we had a fearful quarrel i dare say i was unjust the next morning he was dead dead i cried 
Yes, he shot himself with a revolver. Some of the blood splashed upon the frame of the picture just where the name had been painted. By the time I arrived, his servant had sent for me at once, the police were already there. He had left a letter for me, evidently written in the greatest agitation and distress of mind. What was in it? I asked. Oh, that he believed absolutely in Willie Hughes, that the forgery of the picture had been done simply as a concession to me, and did not in the slightest degree invalidate the truth of the theory, and that in order to show me how firm and flawless his faith in the whole thing was, he was going to offer his life as a sacrifice to the secret of the sonnets. It was a foolish, mad letter. I remember he ended by saying that he entrusted to me the Willie Hughes theory, and that it was for me to present it to the world and to unlock the secret of Shakespeare's heart. It is a most tragic story, I cried. But why have you not carried out his wishes? Erskine shrugged his shoulders. Because it is a perfectly unsound theory from beginning to end, he answered. My dear Erskine, I said, getting up from my seat. You are entirely wrong about the whole matter. It is the only perfect key to Shakespeare's sonnets that has ever been made. It is complete in every detail. I believe in Willie Hughes. Don't say that, said Erskine gravely. I believe there is something fatal about the idea, and intellectually there is nothing to be said for it. I have gone into the whole matter, and I assure you the theory is entirely fallacious. It is plausible up to a certain point. Then it stops. For heaven's sake, my dear boy, don't take up the subject of Willie Hughes. You will break your heart over it. Erskine, I answered, it is your duty to give this theory to the world. If you will not do it, I will. By keeping it back, you wrong the memory of Cyril Graham, the youngest and the most splendid of all the martyrs of literature. I entreat you to do him justice. He died for this thing. Don't let his death be in vain. Erskine looked at me in amazement. You are carried away by the sentiment of the whole story, he said. You forget that a thing is not necessarily true because a man dies for it. I was devoted to Cyril Graham. His death was a horrible blow to me. I did not recover it for years. I don't think I have ever recovered it. But Willie Hughes? There is nothing in the idea of Willie Hughes. No such person ever existed. As for bringing the whole thing before the world, the world thinks that Cyril Graham shot himself by accident. The only proof of his suicide was contained in the letter to me, and of this letter the public never heard anything. To the present day, Lord Crediton thinks that the whole thing was accidental. Cyril Graham sacrificed his life to a great idea, I answered, and if you will not tell his martyrdom, tell at least of his faith. His faith, said Erskine, was fixed in a thing that was false, in a thing that was unsound, in a thing that no Shakespearean scholar would accept for a moment. The theory would be laughed at. Don't make a fool of yourself, and don't follow a trail that leads nowhere. You start by assuming the existence of the very person whose existence is the thing to be proved. Besides, everybody knows that the sonnets were addressed to Lord Pembroke. The matter is settled once for all. The matter is not settled, I exclaimed. I will take up the theory where Cyril Graham left it, and I will prove to the world that he was right. Silly boy, said Erskine. Go home. It is after two, and don't think about Willie Hughes any more. I am sorry I told you anything about it and very sorry indeed that I should have converted you to a thing in which I don't believe. You have given me the key to the greatest mystery of modern literature, I answered, and I shall not rest till I have made you recognize, till I have made everybody recognize, that Cyril Graham was the most subtle Shakespearean critic of our day. As I walked home through St. James's Park, the dawn was just breaking over London. The white swans were lying asleep on the polished lake, and the gaunt palace looked purple against the pale green sky. I thought of Cyril Graham, and my eyes filled with tears. End of section 9, chapter 1 Chapter 2 It was past twelve o'clock when I awoke, and the sun was streaming in through the curtains of my room in long slanting beams of dusty gold. 
I told my servant that I would be at home to no one, and after I had had a cup of chocolate and a petit pain, I took down from the bookshelf a copy of Shakespeare's sonnets and began to go carefully through them. Every poem seemed to me to corroborate Cyril Graham's theory. I felt as if I had my hand upon Shakespeare's heart and was counting each separate throb and pulse of passion. I thought of the wonderful boy actor and saw his face in every line. Two sonnets, I remember, struck me particularly. They were the 53rd and the 67th. In the first of these, Shakespeare, complimenting Willie Hughes on the versatility of his acting, on his wide range of parts, a range extending from Rosalind to Juliet, and from Beatrice to Ophelia, says to him, What is your substance, whereof are you made, that millions of strange shadows on you tend? Since every one hath, every one, one shade, and you but one, can every shadow lend. Lines that would be unintelligible if they were not addressed to an actor, for the word shadow had in Shakespeare's day a technical meaning connected with the stage. The best in this kind are but shadows, says Theseus of the actors in the Midsummer Night's Dream, and there are many similar allusions in the literature of the day. These sonnets evidently belong to the series in which Shakespeare discusses the nature of the actor's art, and of the strange and rare temperament that is essential to the perfect stage player. How is it, says Shakespeare to Willie Hughes, that you have so many personalities? And then he goes on to point out that his beauty is such that it seems to realize every form and phase of fancy, to embody each dream of the creative imagination, an idea that is still further expanded in the sonnet that immediately follows, where, beginning with the fine thought, Oh, how much more doth beauty beauteous seem by that sweet ornament which truth doth give. Shakespeare invites us to notice how the truth of acting, the truth of visible presentation on the stage, adds to the wonder of poetry, giving life to its loveliness and actual reality to its ideal form. And yet, in the 67th sonnet, Shakespeare calls upon Willie Hughes to abandon the stage with its artificiality, its false mimic life of painted face and unreal costume, its immoral influences and suggestions, its remoteness from the true world of noble action and sincere utterance. Ah, wherefore with infection should he live, and with his presence grace impiety, that sin by him advantage should achieve and lace itself with his society? Why should false painting imitate his cheek, and steel dead seeming of his living hue? Why should poor beauty indirectly seek roses of shadow, since his rose is true? It may seem strange that so great a dramatist as Shakespeare, who realized his own perfection as an artist and his humanity as a man on the ideal plane of stage writing and stage playing, should have written in these terms about the theatre. But we must remember that in sonnets 110 and 111, Shakespeare shows us that he too was wearied of the world of puppets, and full of shame at having made himself a motley to the view. The 111th sonnet is especially bitter. Oh, for my sake do you with fortune chide, the guilty goddess of my harmful deeds, that did not better for my life provide than public means which public manners breeds. Thence comes it that my name receives a brand, and almost thence my nature is subdued to what it works in, like the dyer's hand. Pity me, then, and wish I were renewed. And there are many signs elsewhere of the same feelings, signs familiar to all real students of Shakespeare. One point puzzled me immensely as I read the sonnets and it was days before I struck on the true interpretation, which indeed Cyril Graham himself seems to have missed. I could not understand how it was that Shakespeare set so high a value on his young friend marrying. He himself had married young, and the result had been unhappiness, and it was not likely that he would have asked Willie Hughes to commit the same error. The boy player of Rosalind had nothing to gain from marriage, or from the passions of real life, the early sonnets, with their strange entreaties to have children, seemed to me a jarring note. The explanation of the mystery came on me quite suddenly, and I found it in the curious dedication. It will be remembered that the dedication runs as follows. 
to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets mr w h all happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth t t some scholars have supposed that the word begetter in this dedication means simply the procurer of the sonnets for thomas thorpe the publisher but this view is now generally abandoned and the highest authorities are quite agreed that it is to be taken in the sense of inspirer the metaphor being drawn from the analogy of physical life now i saw that the same metaphor was used by shakespeare himself all through the poems and this set me on the right track finally i made my great discovery the marriage that shakespeare proposes for willie hughes is the marriage with his muse an expression which is definitely put forward in the eighty-second sonnet where in the bitterness of his heart at the defection of the boy actor for whom he had written his greatest parts and whose beauty had indeed suggested them he opens his complaint by saying i grant thou wert not married to my muse the children he begs him to beget are no children of flesh and blood but more immortal children of undying fame the whole cycle of the early sonnets is simply shakespeare's invitation to willie hughes to go upon the stage and become a player how barren and profitless a thing he says is this beauty of yours if it be not used when forty winters shall besiege thy brow and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now will be a tattered weed of small worth held then being asked where all thy beauty lies where all the treasure of thy lusty days to say within thine own deep sunken eyes were an all-eating shame and thriftless praise you must create something in art my verse is thine and born of thee only listen to me and i will bring forth eternal numbers to outlive long date and you shall people with forms of your own image the imaginary world of the stage these children that you beget he continues will not wither away as mortal children do but you shall live in them and in my plays do but make thee another self for love of me that beauty still may live in thine or thee i collected all the passages that seemed to me to corroborate this view and they produced a strong impression on me and showed me how complete cyril graham's theory really was i also saw that it was quite easy to separate those lines in which he speaks of the sonnets themselves from those in which he speaks of his great dramatic work this was a point that had been entirely overlooked by all critics up to cyril graham's day and yet it was one of the most important points in the whole series of poems to the sonnets shakespeare was more or less indifferent he did not wish to rest his fame on them they were to him his slight muse as he calls them and intended as mears tells us for private circulation only among a few a very few friends upon the other hand he was extremely conscious of the high artistic value of his plays and shows a noble self-reliance upon his dramatic genius when he says to willie hughes but thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair thou owest nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest so long as men can breathe or eyes can see so long lives this and this gives life to thee the expression eternal lines clearly alludes to one of his plays that he was sending him at the time just as the concluding couplet points to his confidence in the probability of his plays being always acted in his address to the dramatic muse sonnets one hundred and one hundred one we find the same feeling where art thou muse that thou forgetst so long to speak of that which gives thee all thy might spendest thou thy fury on some worthless song darkening thy power to lend base subjects light he cries and then he proceeds to reproach the mistress of tragedy and comedy for her neglect of truth and beauty died and says because he needs no praise wilt thou be dumb excuse not silence so for it lies in these to make him much outlive a gilded tomb and to be praised of ages yet to be then do thy office muse 
i teach thee how to make him seem long hence as he shows now it is however perhaps in the fifty-fifth sonnet that shakespeare gives to this idea its fullest expression to imagine that the powerful rhyme of the second line refers to the sonnet itself is to mistake shakespeare's meaning entirely it seemed to me that it was extremely likely from the general character of the sonnet that a particular play was meant and that the play was none other but romeo and juliet not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme but you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time when wasteful wars shall statues overturn and broils root out the work of masonry nor mars his sword nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory against death and all oblivious enmity shall you pace forth your praise shall still find room even in the eyes of all posterity that wear this world out to the ending doom so till the judgment that yourself arise you live in this and dwell in lovers eyes it was also extremely suggestive to note how here as elsewhere shakespeare promised willie hughes immortality in a form that appealed to men's eyes that is to say in a spectacular form in a play that is to be looked at for two weeks i worked hard at the sonnets hardly ever going out and refusing all invitations every day i seemed to be discovering something new and willie hughes became to me a kind of spiritual presence an ever dominant personality i could almost fancy that i saw him standing in the shadow of my room so well had shakespeare drawn him with his golden hair his tender flower-like grace his dreamy deep sunken eyes his delicate mobile limbs and his white lily hands his very name fascinated me willie hughes willie hughes how musically it sounded yes who else but he could have been the master mistress of shakespeare's passion the lord of his love to whom he was bound in vassalage the delicate minion of pleasure the rose of the whole world the herald of the spring decked in the proud livery of youth the lovely boy whom it was sweet music to hear and whose beauty was the very raiment of shakespeare's heart as it was the keystone of his dramatic power how bitter now seemed the whole tragedy of his desertion and his shame shame that he made sweet and lovely by the mere magic of his personality but that was none the less shame yet as shakespeare forgave him should not we forgive him also i did not care to pry into the mystery of his sin his abandonment of shakespeare's theatre was a different matter and i investigated it at great length finally i came to the conclusion that cyril graham had been wrong in regarding the rival dramatist of the eightieth sonnet as chapman it was obviously marlowe who was alluded to at the time the sonnets were written such an expression as the proud full sail of his great verse could not have been used of chapman's work however applicable it might have been to the style of his later jacobean plays no marlowe was clearly the rival dramatist of whom shakespeare spoke in such laudatory terms and that affable familiar ghost which nightly gulls him with intelligence was the mephistopheles of his dr faustus no doubt marlowe was fascinated by the beauty and grace of the boy actor and lured him away from the blackfriars theatre that he might play the gaveston of his edward the second that shakespeare had the legal right to retain willie hughes in his own company is evident from sonnet eighty seven where he says farewell thou art too dear for my possessing and like enough thou knowest thy estimate the charter of thy worth gives thee releasing my bonds in thee are all determinate for how do i hold thee but by thy granting and for that riches where is my deserving the cause of this fair gift in me is wanting and so my patent back again is swerving thyself thou gayest thy own worth then not knowing or me to whom thou gavest it else mistaking so thy great gift upon misprision growing 
comes home again on better judgment making thus have i had thee as a dream doth flatter in sleep a king but waking no such matter but him whom he could not hold by love he would not hold by force willie hughes became a member of lord pembroke's company and perhaps in the open yard of the red bull tavern played the part of king edward's delicate minion on marlowe's death he seems to have returned to shakespeare who whatever his fellow-partners may have thought of the matter was not slow to forgive the wilfulness and treachery of the young actor how well too had shakespeare drawn the temperament of the stage player willie hughes was one of those that do not do the thing they most do show who moving others are themselves as stone he could act love but could not feel it could mimic passion without realizing it in many looks the false heart's history is writ in moods and frowns and wrinkles strange but with willie hughes it was not so heaven says shakespeare in a sonnet of mad idolatry heaven in thy creation did decree that in thy face sweet love should ever dwell whate'er thy thoughts or thy heart's workings be thy looks should nothing thence but sweetness tell in his inconstant mind and his false heart it was easy to recognize the insincerity and treachery that somehow seem inseparable from the artistic nature as in his love of praise that desire for immediate recognition that characterizes all actors and yet more fortunate in this than other actors willie hughes was to know something of immortality inseparably connected with shakespeare's plays he was to live in them your name from hence immortal life shall have though i once gone to all the world must die the earth can yield me but a common grave when you entombed in men's eyes shall lie your monument shall be my gentle verse which eyes not yet created shall o'er read and tongues to be your being shall rehearse when all the breathers of this world are dead there were endless allusions also to willie hughes's power over his audience the gazers as shakespeare calls them but perhaps the most perfect description of his wonderful mastery over dramatic art was in a lover's complaint where shakespeare says of him in him a plenitude of subtle matter applied to caudles all strange forms receives of burning blushes or of weeping water or swooning paleness and he takes and leaves in either's aptness as it best deceives to blush at speech's rank to weep at woes or to turn white and swoon at tragic shows so on the tip of his subduing tongue all kinds of arguments and questions deep all replication prompt and reason strong for his advantage still did wake and sleep to make the weeper laugh the laugher weep he had the dialect and the different skill catching all passions in his craft of will once i thought that i had really found willie hughes in elizabethan literature in a wonderfully graphic account of the last days of the great earl of essex his chaplain thomas nell tells us that the night before the earl died he called william hughes which was his musician to play upon the virginals and to sing play said he my song will hughes and i will sing it to myself so he did it most joyfully not as the howling swan which still looking down waileth her end but as a sweet lark lifting up his hands and casting up his eyes to his god with this mounted the crystal skies and reached with his unwearied tongue the top of highest heavens surely the boy who played on the virginals to the dying father of sidney's stella was none other but the will hughes to whom shakespeare dedicated the sonnets and whom he tells us was himself sweet music to hear yet lord essex died in fifteen seventy six when shakespeare himself was but twelve years of age it was impossible that his musician could have been the mr w h of the sonnets perhaps shakespeare's young friend was the son of the player upon the virginals it was at least something to have discovered that will hughes was an elizabethan name 
indeed the name hughes seemed to have been closely connected with music and the stage the first english actress was the lovely margaret hughes whom prince rupert so madly loved what more probable than that between her and lord essex musician had come the boy actor of shakespeare's plays but the proofs the links where were they alas i could not find them it seemed to me that i was always on the brink of absolute verification but that i could never really attain it from willie hughes's life i soon passed to thoughts of his death i used to wonder what had been his end perhaps he had been one of those english actors who in sixteen o four went across sea to germany and played before the great duke henry julius of brunswick himself a dramatist of no mean order and at the court of that strange elector of brandenburg who was so enamoured of beauty that he was said to have bought for his weight in amber the young son of a travelling greek merchant and to have given pageants in honour of his slave all through that dreadful famine year of sixteen o six to sixteen o seven when the people died of hunger in the very streets of the town and for the space of seven months there was no rain we know at any rate that romeo and juliet was brought out at dresden in sixteen thirteen along with hamlet and king lear and it was surely to none other than willie hughes that in sixteen fifteen the death mask of shakespeare was brought by the hand of one of the suite of the english ambassador pale token of the passing away of the great poet who had so dearly loved him indeed there would have been something peculiarly fitting in the idea that the boy actor whose beauty had been so vital an element in the realism and romance of shakespeare's art should have been the first to have brought to germany the seed of the new culture and was in his way the precursor of that aufklärung or illumination of the eighteenth century that splendid movement which though begun by lessing and herder and brought to its full and perfect issue by goethe was in no small part helped on by another actor friedrich schroeder who awoke the popular consciousness and by means of the feigned passions and mimetic methods of the stage showed the intimate the vital connection between life and literature if this was so and there was certainly no evidence against it it was not improbable that willie hughes was one of those english comedians mime quidum ex britannia as the old chronicle calls them who were slain at nuremberg in a sudden uprising of the people and were secretly buried in a little vineyard outside the city by some young men who had found pleasure in their performances and of whom some had sought to be instructed in the mysteries of the new art certainly no more fitting place could there be for him to whom shakespeare said thou art all my art than this little vineyard outside the city walls for was it not from the sorrows of dionysos that tragedy sprang was not the light laughter of comedy with its careless merriment and quick replies first heard on the lips of the sicilian vine dressers nay did not the purple and red stain of the wine froth on face and limbs give the first suggestion of the charm and fascination of disguise the desire for self-concealment the sense of the value of objectivity thus showing itself in the rude beginnings of the art at any rate wherever he lay whether in the little vineyard at the gate of the gothic town or in some dim london churchyard amidst the roar and bustle of our great city no gorgeous monument marked his resting-place his true tomb as shakespeare saw was the poet's verse his true monument the permanence of the drama so had it been with others whose beauty had given a new creative impulse to their age the ivory body of the bithynian slave rots in the green ooze of the nile and on the yellow hills of the ceramicus is strewn the dust of the young athenian but antinous lives in sculpture and carmides in philosophy end of section ten section eleven the portrait of mr w h chapter three after three weeks had elapsed i determined to make a strong appeal to erskine to do justice to the memory of cyril graham and to give to the world his marvellous interpretation of the sonnets the only interpretation that thoroughly explained the problem i have not any copy of my letter i regret to say nor have i been able to lay my hand upon the original but i remember that i went over the whole ground 
and covered sheets of paper with passionate reiteration of the arguments and proofs that my study had suggested to me. It seemed to me that I was not merely restoring Cyril Graham to his proper place in literary history, but rescuing the honor of Shakespeare himself from the tedious memory of a commonplace intrigue. I put into the letter all my enthusiasm. I put into the letter all my faith. No sooner, in fact, had I sent it off, than a curious reaction came over me. It seemed to me that I had given away my capacity for belief in the Willie Hughes theory of the sonnets, that something had gone out of me, as it were, and that I was perfectly indifferent to the whole subject. What was it that had happened? It is difficult to say. Perhaps by finding perfect expression for a passion, I had exhausted the passion itself. Emotional forces, like the forces of physical life, have their positive limitations. Perhaps the mere effort to convert anyone to a theory involves some form of renunciation of the power of credence. Perhaps I was simply tired of the whole thing, and my enthusiasm having burnt out, my reason was left to its own unimpassioned judgment. However it came about, and I cannot pretend to explain it, there was no doubt that Willie Hughes suddenly became to me a mere myth, an idle dream, the boyish fancy of a young man who, like most ardent spirits, was more anxious to convince others than to be himself convinced. As I had said some very unjust and bitter things to Erskine in my letter, I determined to go and see him at once, and to make my apologies to him for my behavior. Accordingly, the next morning, I drove down to Birdcage Walk, and found Erskine sitting in his library, with the forged picture of Willie Hughes in front of him. "'My dear Erskine,' I cried, "'I have come to apologize to you.' "'To apologize to me?' he said. "'What for?' "'For my letter,' I answered. "'You have nothing to regret in your letter,' he said. "'On the contrary, you have done me the greatest service in your power.' You have shown me that Cyril Graham's theory is perfectly sound. "'You don't mean to say that you believe in Willie Hughes?' I exclaimed. "'Why not?' he rejoined. "'You have proved the thing to me. Do you think I cannot estimate the value of evidence?' "'But there is no evidence at all,' I groaned, sinking into a chair. "'When I wrote to you, I was under the influence of a perfectly silly enthusiasm. I had been touched by the story of Cyril Graham's death fascinated by his romantic theory, enthralled by the wonder and novelty of the whole idea. I see now that the theory is based on a delusion. The only evidence for the existence of Willie Hughes is that picture in front of you, and the picture is a forgery. Don't be carried away by mere sentiment in this matter. Whatever romance may have to say about the Willie Hughes theory, reason is dead against it. "'I don't understand you,' said Erskine, looking at me in amazement. "'Why, you yourself have convinced me, by your letter, "'that Willie Hughes is an absolute reality. "'Why have you changed your mind? "'Or is all that you have been saying to me merely a joke?' "'I cannot explain it to you,' I rejoined. "'But I see now that there is really nothing to be said "'in favor of Cyril Graham's interpretation. "'The sonnets are addressed to Lord Pembroke.' For heaven's sake, don't waste your time in a foolish attempt to discover a young Elizabethan actor who never existed, and to make a phantom puppet the center of the great cycle of Shakespeare's sonnets. I see that you don't understand the theory, he replied. My dear Erskine, I cried, not understand it? Why, I feel as if I had invented it. Surely my letter shows you that I not merely went into the whole matter, but that I contributed proofs of every kind. The one flaw in the theory is that it presupposes the existence of the person whose existence is the subject of dispute. If we grant that there was in Shakespeare's company a young actor of the name of Willie Hughes, it is not difficult to make him the object of the sonnets. But as we know that there was no actor of this name in the company of the Globe Theatre, it is idle to pursue the investigation further. But that is exactly what we don't know, said Erskine. It is quite true that his name does not occur in the list given in the first folio, but as Cyril pointed out, that is rather a proof in favor of the existence of Willie Hughes than against it, if we remember his treacherous desertion of Shakespeare for a rival dramatist. 
We argued the matter over for hours, but nothing that I could say could make Erskine surrender his faith in Cyril Graham's interpretation. He told me that he intended to devote his life to proving the theory, and that he was determined to do justice to Cyril Graham's memory. I entreated him, laughed at him, begged of him, but it was of no use. Finally we parted, not exactly in anger, but certainly with a shadow between us. He thought me shallow. I thought him foolish. When I called on him again, his servant told me that he had gone to Germany. Two years afterwards, as I was going into my club, the hall porter handed me a letter with a foreign postmark. It was from Erskine, and written at the Hotel d'Angleterre, Cannes. When I had read it, I was filled with horror, though I did not quite believe that he would be so mad as to carry his resolve into execution. The gist of the letter was that he had tried in every way to verify the Willie Hughes theory, and had failed, and that as Cyril Graham had given his life for this theory, he himself had determined to give his own life also to the same cause. The concluding words of the letter were these. I still believe in Willie Hughes, and by the time you receive this, I shall have died by my own hand for Willie Hughes's sake, for his sake and for the sake of Cyril Graham, whom I drove to his death by my shallow skepticism and ignorant lack of faith. The truth was once revealed to you, and you rejected it. It comes to you now, stained with the blood of two lives. Do not turn away from it. It was a horrible moment. I felt sick with misery, and yet I could not believe it. To die for one's theological beliefs is the worst use a man can make of his life. But to die for a literary theory, it seemed impossible. I looked at the date. The letter was a week old. Some unfortunate chance had prevented my going to the club for several days, or I might have got it in time to save him. Perhaps it was not too late. I drove off to my rooms packed up my things, and started by the night mail from Charing Cross. The journey was intolerable. I thought I would never arrive. As soon as I did, I drove to the Hotel d'Angleterre. They told me that Erskine had been buried two days before in the English cemetery. There was something horribly grotesque about the whole tragedy. I said all kinds of wild things, and the people in the hall looked curiously at me. Suddenly, Lady Erskine, in deep mourning, passed across the vestibule. When she saw me, she came up to me, murmured something about her poor son, and burst into tears. I led her into her sitting-room. An elderly gentleman was there waiting for her. It was the English doctor. We talked a great deal about Erskine, but I said nothing about his motive for committing suicide. It was evident that he had not told his mother anything about the reason— that had driven him to so fatal, so mad an act. Finally, Lady Erskine rose and said, George left you something as a memento. It was a thing he prized very much. I will get it for you. As soon as she had left the room, I turned to the doctor and said, What a dreadful shock it must have been to Lady Erskine. I wonder that she bears it as well as she does. Oh, she knew for months past that it was coming, he answered. "'Knew it for months past,' I cried. "'But why didn't she stop him? "'Why didn't she have him watched? "'He must have been mad.' "'The doctor stared at me. "'I don't know what you mean,' he said. "'Well,' I cried, "'if a mother knows that her son is going to commit suicide—' "'Suicide?' he answered. "'Poor Erskine did not commit suicide. "'He died of consumption. "'He came here to die.' The moment I saw him I knew that there was no hope. One lung was almost gone, and the other was very much affected. Three days before he died he asked me, was there any hope? I told him frankly that there was none, and that he had only a few days to live. He wrote some letters and was quite resigned, retaining his senses to the last. At that moment Lady Erskine entered the room with the fatal picture of Willie Hughes in her hand. "'When George was dying, he begged me to give you this,' she said. "'As I took it from her, her tears fell on my hand. "'The picture hangs now in my library, "'where it is very much admired by my artistic friends. 
they have decided that it is not a cluet but an oudry i have never cared to tell them its true history but sometimes when i look at it i think that there is really a great deal to be said for the willie hughes theory of shakespeare's sonnets end of section eleven end of lord arthur seville's crime and other stories by oscar wilde